Hi there, I'm Kelly Danfus, I'm the Chancellor here at Arkansas State University, and I want to add my personal welcome to everyone who is participating in the 2021 Create at State sessions. This time last year, we were in the opening months of Arkansas State's response to the global pandemic. Before saying too much more, I want to congratulate and thank everyone who kept Create at State tradition going in 2020. I say that because our faculty, staff, and alumni who volunteer to make Create at State a success had to consider if they could or even if they should continue. But I'm intensely proud that in the best tradition of both A State and Create, they collaborated and innovated for an all online event last year. I want to point out something that's very important about last year's event and this year's event in this new digital format. The number of presentations and participants has actually increased with our online event. I know we're all looking ahead to more traditional presentations in future years at Create State, but in many ways, these online presentations have made access to a larger audience possible. Now I'm excited to check in on those presentations that have piqued my own scholarly interests, and it's great that I can log in, watch for a while, and then check back out when I have a meeting to attend. In closing, I want to commend everyone for their hard work, but a special thanks to the faculty involved here. You have kept one of our most basic functions moving these past 14 months, promoting research and creative endeavors by our undergraduate students. I appreciate it, and I know our students appreciate it as well. Thank you to each and every one of you, and good luck. Wolves up. Welcome to the College of Nursing and Health Professions Created State. I'm Susan Hanrahan, Dean of the College of Nursing and Health Professions. We have another virtual showcase that I'm very proud of today with 68 poster and platform presentations from our undergraduate and graduate students. I'm excited because we have some new faculty mentors also this year, as well as a large number of our faculty who continue to support our student research. Today, you'll see an eclectic array of topics, most are related to clinical practice involving things like technology, disease processes, patient populations, all of this in an effort to provide practice that's evidence-based, which theoretically should improve patient outcomes and the cost of care. You know, good health is optimal for any activity that we wanna do in our life. So I hope our students and our faculty continue the pursuit of positively impacting the clinical and social needs of our patients and their families. We have a lot of work to do and 68 presentations today is a great start on that. So I want a special thanks to everybody involved in this forum. It's gonna be great and I'm so excited. Some presentations are the results of a classroom project, oral history, service training, assessment, journalism, or quality improvement activities. Such activities may have been deemed not to meet HHS OHRP definitions of human subject research designed to develop or contribute to generalizable knowledge and thus did not undergo IRB review. Hi, my name is Kristen Anderson. I'm a Bachelor's of Science in Nursing student here at Arkansas State University, and my thesis is the effect of kangaroo care on the length of time premature infants spend in the NICU. Prematurity is defined as being born before 37 weeks of gestation, and it is a leading cause of death in children under the age of five. Kangaroo care is typically defined as skin-to-skin -skin contact between a newborn and a parent and nearly exclusive intake of breast milk. It is being studied as an alternative or supplement to traditional infant care. This study specifically looked at the effect of kangaroo care on length of stay and discharge criteria in the neonatal intensive care unit. An increased length of stay actually increases the infant's risk of infection and developmental delays due to stimulation. Review of the literature shows that kangaroo care had a positive impact on weight gain, increased breastfeeding at discharge, reduced mortality rates, and reduced risk of sepsis in the NICU. However, results surrounding the length of stay in the literature were rarely reported and were conflicting or not statistically significant. This study was implemented via a retrospective chart review at St. Bernard's Neonatal Intensive Care Unit. Charts were pulled from their database of infants born less than 37 weeks of gestation between March 2019 and March 2020. Information was then gathered on an infant's weight, length, gestational age at birth and discharge, respiratory support, feedings, parental visits, length of stay, and number of kangaroo care sessions. Data, data was analyzing using SPSS statistics. 50 charts were reviewed, but only 35 were used for data collection and analysis. 
Infants born less than 30, after 35 weeks of gestation were actually excluded because they typically did not spend much time in the NICU. Also excluded were infants with incomplete chart records due to transfers, and one infant that had no kangaroo care sessions was determined an outlier. The primary hypothesis of the study is that kangaroo care would decrease length of stay in the NICU. Secondarily, increased sessions of kangaroo care would lead to decreased stays until full oral feedings, decreased stays on respiratory support, and decreased incidences of infection. It would also lead to increased length and weight gain. 35 infants were analyzed with an average gestational age of 32 weeks in one day at birth. The average length of stay was 36.91 days. The average number of kangaroo care sessions was 28.57 with a minimum of one and a maximum of 210. A Pearson's R correlation test was then used to determine if kangaroo care had any effect and correlation on length of stay, weight change, length change, respiratory support, or feedings. There was a weak positive correlation found between kangaroo care and length of stay at a 0.262 and a significance level greater than 0.05. This was opposite of our expected hypothesis. Kangaroo care versus weight change was found to be moderately statistically significant at a value of 0.358 and a significance level less than 0.05. Kangaroo care was also found to be moderately statistically significant versus weight change at a value of 0.528 and significance level less than 0.01. Kangaroo care and parental visits were found to be strongly correlated at a level of 0.988 and a significance level of less than 0.01. Here are the charts showing the values I just described, circle in red. There were a few limitations in this study. One was a delay in IRB processing that limited data collection to one month instead of the proposed two. This resulted in a lower number of charts reviewed than anticipated. Also, no true control group could be defined due to only one infant having zero sessions of kangaroo care. No genders or race were documented to determine if they had any effect on length of stay. And finally, frequencies of occurrences and the variables were hand tallied, which could have resulted in calculation errors. Kangaroo care versus length of stay was a weak positive correlation, which was the opposite of our predicted hypothesis. This actually concurs with our literature that found no statistical significance between kangaroo care and length of stay. However, there was a statistical significance between kangaroo care and leak change and kangaroo care and weight change. A Cochrane review concurred with this result. However, another meta-analysis found no correlation between those variables. This is statistically significant and significant in the real world because weight and leak gain are meaningful in a NICU. These variables show that infants are being nutritionally supported and are thriving and that kangaroo care is contributing to that. There was also a strong correlation noted between kangaroo care and parental visit, which shows that parents are interacting, bonding, and being involved in their child's care while in the NICU. These are references used for this presentation, and thank you all for your time. Hi, my name is Cassie Clement, and I am an undergraduate nursing student. I chose for my honors senior thesis to research nursing student and nursing faculty perceptions of ICU patient sleep. So sleep is a periodic reversible state of disengagement from the environment, and it is essential, like breathing, eating, and drinking. Patients in a hospital must have sleep. Sleep is an important component in the well-being of an individual and plays a role in healing. Poor sleep quality is a common complaint in hospitals and is consistently reported by patients in the ICU. And alarmingly, sleep is of particular importance for these patients in the ICU because they have an increased anabolic requirement. Patients are often disturbed during the nighttime hours beyond what is necessary for their excellent care. And nurses need to make every effort to ensure that these patients are getting the best quality sleep possible. Nurses play a central role in monitoring and encouraging patient sleep and are instrumental in creating environments that are conducive to sleep. So in order to gather further information about sleeping critical care patients, I surveyed nursing students and nursing faculty to determine their perceptions of sleep in critical care patients. So a survey, a survey made up of 17 questions was sent out via publicly available email addresses to all senior nursing students and current nursing faculty over the age of 18. 
I had 47 participants in this survey, and the survey was created through Qualtrix and sent out two different times. It contained free response, multiple choice, and a ranking questions with a zero to 10 scale. Data that was collected from this survey were analyzed and um, compared in order to determine trends. So some demographic data for my participants, the median age was 23 and the average age was 21. There were four males and 43 females who completed the survey. 18 of them were nursing faculty and 29 were nursing students. 16 had worked in the critical care setting while 31 had not. And of the nursing students, 19 had completed their critical care rotation and 10 had not. Participants were also polled on how much sleep that they received nightly and their answers ranged from five to nine hours. So when asked if most ICU patients obtain adequate quality and quantity of sleep, 47 said no and none said yes. When asked how important that they believe sleep to be in ICU patients, 34 said extremely important and 13 said very important. So these graphs represent the response of patients, of participants, when asked to choose a number between zero and 10 that best represented the negative degree that these factors impacted sleep in the critical care setting. So the top left shows light exposure, the top right shows patient care activities, and the bottom shows a noisy environment. And these graphs represent the response of participants when asked to choose a number between zero and 10 that best represented the positive degree that these factors impacted sleep in the critical care setting. So the top left shows earplugs, the top right shows eye masks, and the bottom shows sedatives and sleeping pills. And these are some more of the response of participants when asked about positive factors. On the left is staff education, and on the right is clustered care. And clustered care is when um, patient care activities are tried, when providers try to do them at the same time instead of spreading them out. So at the end of this survey, participants were also polled on suggestions that they had for improving patient sleep. And clustered care was the most common answer. Earplugs and staff education and staff awareness were also popular answers. Um, and these are some of my findings. All 47 of my participants indicated that critical care patients do not receive sufficient quali quality or quantity of sleep. And all of them rank sleep as either extremely important or very important. These findings were encouraging to me and were expected just with the literature that I've viewed about sleep in ICU patients. The ICU has been described as a noisy environment with a high level of in-room interruptions and excessive light exposure and a place where many patient care activities make it difficult to lower noise and that patients need constant assessment and interventions as frequent as every five to 15 minutes. So the average of the participant ratings for negative factors showed that they believed noise to be the most detrimental to patient sleep. This was followed by patient care activities and light exposure was on average ranked to be the least harmful. Of the positive factors, eye mask and earplugs were on average thought to be the least helpful, and these were followed by sleeping pills and sedatives, then staff education, and clustered care was ranked on average to be the most helpful. Um, and then some of my limitations include that the response rate was only 39.8%, and so it might not have shown as high of correlations as possible. The survey was in a limited area, and there were modifications necessary due to COVID. So these are my references. Thank you so much for your time. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bethany Harbin and I am an undergraduate researcher at Arkansas State University. Um, my focus of study was healthcare faculty attitudes toward recycling in the clinical setting. So the project objective was to um, determine the feasibility of recycling in the clinical setting. So similar to everything in the medical field, prevention is always better than cure. This can also be applied to the healthcare of the environment. So solid waste mismanagement is a global phenomenon leading to an increase in green greenhouse gas production, which causes increases in temperatures worldwide. These temperatures cause things like increased heat waves, decrease in air quality, increase in natural disasters and in infectious diseases and many other things. Um, so why is this related to nursing? Um, for two main reasons, really. First, for people who fall victim to these consequences of climate change, AKA these infectious diseases um, or people displaced by natural disasters, they might, on, they might end up on the receiving end of our care. But also we as nurses can decrease the amount of waste that is mismanaged 
activities in the US health sector alone create 10% of our greenhouse gases. Um, this can be decreased by recycling all of the basins, pitchers, trays, flexible primary packaging, and all of those things listed on the slide right there. So we do have an impact on how we can affect the environment. Um, so to be a participant in this study, respondents had to be medical faculty at Arkansas State University, either part of the College of Nursing and Health Professions, Clinical Lab Sciences, Physical Therapy, Occupational Ther Therapy, or Medical Imaging and Radiation Sciences. Participants also had to be 18 years or older, and their emails had to be available to the public domain on the Arkansas State website. Um, a 15 item survey was sent out. It was created with Qualtrics. These questions consisted of um, items related to recycling, knowledge about recycling, climate change, and willingness to recycle in the clinical setting. The survey was sent out two times following IRB approval. Um, 42 participants of 79 who the email were sent to responded. Data was placed in an Excel document and it was um, examined to determine trends. So there are a few slides with graphs that I am going to show you, so I will flip through these rather quickly. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. The first few questions that I asked were demographic questions. Do you consent? Are you 18 years or older? And what part? Of, what college are you a part of? Um, 27 participants were part of the Nursing and Health Professions College. Six were from Radiation Sciences, four from PT, three from OT, and two from um, Lab Sciences. Um, this graph just shows of those 42 participants, how many did recycle regularly at home? 57% does, 43% does not. Um, this next slide just um, has a graph that shows the correlation between faculty who do recycle at home and their personal opinion on the importance of recycling. This was rated on a scale from zero to 10, zero being least important, 10 being most important. Um, this next slide is probably my favorite graph from my entire project. The data displayed here represents how many trash cans on average each medical professional filled up per patient per shift according to which college they were a part of. Um, this next graph displays the willingness of staff to be able to walk the extra steps to reach a recycl recycling receptacle during the workday. I believe this data actually displays a lot as we all know how busy medical professionals are in the clinic clinical setting during the work day. Um, this chart is a little busy, I know, but it does display three sets of data. The dark orange does display how important environmental concerns were to the participants. The orange displays how concerned they are about climate change, and the light orange is how much do they believe recycling can impact climate change. This last graph just um, shows the importance of including recycling in the curriculum according to which college the participant does belong to. Um, this is also pretty important data for the discussion. Um, ultimately, from this data, the researcher determined that healthcare faculty at Arkansas State support recycling in the clinical setting. While a larger population was not studied, these results did suggest that medical professionals would be willing to recycle in the clinical setting under certain conditions. I did include one little bit that I did get from my qualitative, my qualitative data from my survey. Um, one partic participant did say their willingness to take the extra steps depends on the level of staffing and how much free time they have. Um, ultimately, healthcare faculty support of recycling and beliefs about its beneficial impact on climate change display that it is feasible to implement recycling protocols in the clinical setting. Um, and these are my references. Thank you so much. Um, and please contact me if you have any questions. Some presentations are the results of a classroom project, oral history, service training, assessment, journalism, or quality improvement activities. Such activities may have been deemed not to meet HHS OHRP definitions of human subject research designed to develop or contribute to generalizable knowledge and thus did not undergo IRB review. Hi, my name is Abby Antisi, and the study I conducted along with my mentor, Dr. Ackberry, was spelling and song, utilizing music as a mnemonic device to increase retention of spelling rules found within the Barton Reading and Spelling System. This study was conducted because in addition to literary deficits, individuals with dyslexia often experience difficulties with retention. The Barton Reading and Spelling System is a standardized treatment approach for dyslexia and literacy intervention that is already being utilized in the Literacy Intervention Program through the Speech and Hearing Center at Arkansas State University. 
The Barton Reading and Spelling System consists of 10 levels and a number of lessons within each level that cover varying topics and rules. There is a substantial body of research showing that music can have a positive impact on student learning in the areas of both retention of the material and student enjoyment. This has been reported on all levels of education from elementary school level to the college level. The purpose of this study was to determine whether utilizing music as a mnemonic device could increase the retention of the spelling rules associated with the Barton Reading and Spelling System. It was hypothesized that the use of music as a mnemonic device would lead to greater retention of the spelling rules found within the Barton Reading and Spelling System. The participants included six students enrolled in the Literacy Intervention Program conducted through the Speech and Hearing Center at ASU. Each of these participants were enrolled in the Literacy Intervention Program based on the diagnosis of dyslexia or parent-teacher concerns about reading difficulties. The participants were enrolled in grades three through six during the fall 2020 semester. The participants were divided evenly into experimental and control groups and matched based upon their grade levels, as well as their levels of completion in the Barton Reading and Spelling System. This study utilized a pretest post test design. The experimental group was shown a YouTube video three times total each week in which the primary investigator performed a song based on the weekly rule. The control group was shown a YouTube video that taught the same content contained in the lyrics of the music. The primary investigator delivered the rules via spoken word alone instead of by song. A series of independent samples t-tests were conducted to determine the difference between the experimental and control groups in terms of performance on several different variables. These variables include words spelled correctly, percent letters in error, letter insertions, letter deletions, and letter substitutions. A series of paired samples t-tests were also conducted to determine the differences between pre-test and post-test performances within the control group and within the experimental group. In terms of words spelled correctly, the variance between the experimental and control group scores was significant on both the pretest and the post-test. Although both pretest and post-test scores were significantly different, both groups spelled more words accurately on the post-test. The variance between the experimental and control groups in terms of percentage letters and error was also significant for both the pretest and the post-test. However, both groups exhibited lower percentages of error following treatment. The variation between the pretest and post-test scores in terms of words spelled correctly was not significant. Although it was not statistically significant within the control group, the participants in the control group spelled more words correctly on the post-test than the pretest on average. Variance between the letters in error on the pretest and letters in error on the post-test was significant. And the participants in the control group showed a significantly lower percentage of letters in error on the post-test as compared to the pretest. In terms of the experimental group, variation between the pretest words correct and post-test words correct, and variance between percentage letters in error on the pretest and the post-test was not significant. However, the participants in the experimental group spelled more words accurately on the post-test than the pretest, and had less percentage letters in error on the post-test than on the pretest. Overall, the results showed that both the control and experimental groups improved in spelling over the course of the study. The presence of improvement in both groups indicates that the use of song did not hinder learning. However, it cannot be determined to be the only factor related to spelling improvement. As detailed in the results section, the experimental and control groups were statistically different in the outset of treatment. It should be noted that clinicians reported client enjoyment of the videos presented. Several clinicians offered feedback that their clients look forward to the video portion of each section above all other portions of their standard biweekly treatment. This study was completed at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, which resulted in several limitations, specifically that telepractice was used constantly for one participant and occasionally for several others due to quarantines. Some songs were also longer than others and thus some rules were repeated more often than the, in the songs than others. However, there is no indication that this affected the results in any manner. Hello, my name is Laura Bass. I'm a radiologic sciences major. My faculty advisor is Jody Nutt, and today I'm going to be talking to y'all about the benefits of using intraoperative radiation therapy, or IORT, to treat breast cancer compared to whole breast irradiation. So right here, I have a picture on the right, and that is what an IORT machine looks like. 
Um, a new approach to delivering radiation therapy that has been explored by researchers and physicians is called intraoperative radiation therapy, or IORT for short. And so traditionally, whole breast irradiation is when a beam is entering the patient's body externally and radiating the tumor and the surrounding tissues. But with IORT, instead of coming in externally, a probe is placed during surgery that delivers the dose to, directly to the tumor bed. And so this allows better shielding for the surrounding healthy tissues. Um, the purpose of this project is to examine the benefits and effectiveness of IORT compared to external beam radiation in order to deliver the best possible treatment for the patient. And research was done in which analyzation of various treatment approaches and combinations were conducted, as well as how they affected patients in the short term and how effective they were overall. So there was two major studies done to assess the effectiveness of using IORT clinically, and those were the Target A trial and the Elliott trial. Um, in the Target A trial, a sample size of about 3,500 women, 45 years and older, were randomly selected to receive a one-time dose using IORT or whole breast irradiation dose um, treatments over a three to five week period. And then in the Elliott study, there was about a 1,300 um, sample size of women, 48 years and older, who were randomly selected to receive a one-time dose using IORT or a WBI with a, with a boost treatment over a six week period. So both of the studies yielded very similar results. Skin toxicity profiles were lower for patients in IORT groups, and there was less reported skin erythema, which is redness of the skin. There was less reported dryness, hyperpigmentation, and itching. And there was also fewer non-breast cancer-related deaths that were also reported for IORT groups. So overall, patients received comparable cosmetic outcomes and experienced a superior breast-related quality of life. But initial research also indicated that the rate of recurrence for patients who were administered IORT were between 3% and 4% compared to 1% or less for patients who were administered whole breast irradiation. So the reason that this happens is when during a whole breast irradiation treatment, the dose delivered to the patient's breast is not only um, the tumor and the tumor bed are not the only things receiving dose, the whole breast is. So if there's any cancer cells that weren't detected through previous imaging, um, those are getting radiated. Um, but with IORT, since the dose is concentrated to that one area and the healthy tissue is shielded, if there's any cancer cells anywhere else in the breast that weren't detected, those don't receive a dose. So that's why the rate of recurrence is a little higher for IORT, but it's still a very small percentage. And there's adaptations of IORT that may decrease this risk. So following initial trials, researchers are continuing to analyze patient factors in conjunction with using IORT and their diagnostic outcomes. And researchers are also considering how adaptations of IORT, such as administering it alongside whole breast irradiation, could possibly yield the same cosmetic benefits to patients while also reducing the rate of recurrence. So you're kind of getting the best of both worlds by trying to incorporate these two into one treatment plan because you're getting the better cosmetic outcomes, the cheaper cost, and the um, a lower dose to the patient with the IORT aspect of it. But with the whole breast irradiation, you are ensuring that the rate of recurrence for that patient is much lower by radiating more uh, area. So in conclusion, intraoperative radiation therapy offers reduced treatment duration and cost effectiveness, as well as its capability to successfully treat breast cancer while irradiating less healthy tissue and yielding less severe side effects. So with further research and clinical trials, IORT has the potential to be a very beneficial and effective treatment option for patients diagnosed with breast cancer. And I personally chose to research this topic because when treating cancer, it's so vital to use the best technology you can and formulate the most optimal treatment plan to ensure that the patients are receiving the highest level of care possible with the most ideal outcomes. And this is just a list of all the references I use when doing my research. And that concludes my presentation and thank you all for listening.
Hello, my name is Chelsea Carver, and these are my classmates, Marina Burns and Bailey Morgan. And we're dietetic students at Arkansas State University. We've come together to create a study about reducing sodium intake in takeout meals. The purpose of the study was to develop an entree to be served in the commercial setting and then reformulate the item to reflect a 25% reduction in sodium. We chose to reformulate a food item to reflect a 25% reduction in sodium because the average American consumes roughly 3,400 milligrams of sodium per day. While the American Heart Association recommends to keep sodium intake to 2,300 milligrams per day. High sodium intake is a major cause of elevated blood pressure and increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. We believe that our Kung Pao chicken recipe can spark fast food restaurants to reduce sodium within their menu options. The methods used to conduct this experiment consisted of participants from the campus community tasting a sample of our original Kung Pao chicken recipe as well as the reduced sodium recipe. A scorecard was filled out and participants chose which sample they liked better according to the categories of taste, texture, and appearance. Through trial and error of the sauce, we used our knowledge of food chemistry to manipulate the original recipe and end up making a 27% sodium reduction in the Kung Pao chicken. Through our blind focus group testing, this reduced sodium recipe scored higher than the original recipe in all three categories of flavor, appearance, and texture. The graph at the bottom shows you just how much. So the goal of this study was to appeal to the target audience of people both with and without hypertension. Um, so having this reduced takeout option will aid in decreasing the risk of hypertension. Um, we'd like to give a special thank you to all of our professors that helped us, especially Dr. Richmond, um, Mr. West, as well as MC Taylor, and our references are at the bottom. Hello, my name is Meredith Greathouse, and I'm presenting my poster on pediatric imaging challenges. Thank you for joining me today. Um, medical imaging is extremely valuable as a diagnostic tool in the pediatric population, but it comes with several distinct challenges. The goal is to reduce pediatric exposure time while still providing high quality images. The purpose of this project is to discuss methods that can contribute to the reduction of pediatric exposure. Our objectives, we will discuss the rationale of the examination with the patient and parent to ensure clear understanding of benefits and risk, discuss the methods of radiation reduction that should be implemented in pediatric imaging, and we will also be discussing ideas that can contribute to the reduction of pediatric exposure. Some methods that we can use to uh, reduce pediatric radiation is immobilization techniques, communication with parents and patients, kid-friendly activities, and staff education, and always practicing LARA. Pediatric population, um, pediatric imaging worldwide represents approximately 10% of all imaging. Children and youth who need diagnostic imaging range from birth to 18 or 21 years old. No matter which of the radiologic technologists' careers you choose, you are likely to work with children. And to me, this is a true statement because I've uh, had clinical experience and I've been to different clinical sites and I've had to perform x-rays on children at every clinical site I've been to. Uh, worldwide, an estimated 3.6 billion diagnostic medical examinations, um, such as x-rays, are performed every year. About 350 million of these are performed on children under 15 years of age. Children are at a higher risk because they have more rapidly dividing cells and greater life expectancy, allowing the clinical manifestation of radiation induced cancers with decades long latency periods. And so as technologists, our job is to um, do everything we possibly can to reduce their risk of cancer and practice radiation safety. Discuss action plan. Do not be afraid to ask um, parents for help. More than likely, they're willing to help you. 
Um, imaging a child can be difficult in positioning them. So if you need help, ask the parent, get them involved. Just, just make sure you shield them appropriately. Give children comforting items such as a toy or a pacifier, um, just to make them comfortable and um, keep them calm. Communication with staff and parents is key. Um, you need to make sure that all staff has an education class on equipment settings for pediatric imaging. We wanna utilize those immobilization equipment if necessary. Um, we wanna eliminate unnecessary exams, avoid repeat exams, and shield dose sensitive organs and always put the patient's needs first. Here I have some images uh, of those immobilization techniques and equipment. So we have a CT scan and they've just um, immobilized his head to keep him from moving to avoid any repeat exams. And then over here we have the Pigistat to also keep the patient or child from moving so we don't have to do any repeat exams. And none of these are harmful at all. They may look a little scary, but they're all very safe. And then uh, this picture demonstrates items you can give a child to um, comfort them. Also, this is an example of how a room uh, for pediatric imaging could look to make the child feel more uh, comfortable. And then we have a um, chart that demonstrates estimated medical radiation dose of five-year-old. And just give some statistics on that. And then my acknowledgement to the Department of Medical Imaging and Radiation Sciences, and then Ms. Joe Nutt. Oh, thank you for joining my presentation. Thank you for your time. Hello, my name is Ariel Kaylee Jones, and I will be presenting why using M mode over pulse wave is recommended in early OB ultrasounds. Introduction and purpose. Ultrasound is the imaging modality used to monitor a fetus in utero throughout the pregnancy. It is used along with other information, such as clinical values, to evaluate the well being of the fetus. Sonography is used because of its use of non ionizing radiation. This means there are no known biological harms caused by ultrasound. However, there is a theoretical biological effect of tissue heating that could potentially cause harm to the developing fetus. Diagnostic medical sonographers should aim to cause the least amount of harm as possible. The purpose of this project is to determine the safest scanning technique for a fetus. Objectives. Sonographers practice ELARA as low as reasonably achievable. Medical professionals also live by a term called beneficence. This means striving to do the largest amount of good for your patient. Sonographers should apply these to their everyday practice. If in mode is safer than pulse wave for a fetus by decreasing the biological effects, sonographers should use in mode exclusively. Research will be referenced. Methods. Qualitative data comparing in mode and pulse wave was reviewed. The accuracy and efficiency of M-mode and pulse wave are discussed on other areas of the body. The methods were not compared on a first trimester fetus because of the risk of potential biological effects on the fetus. Sonography principles and instrumentation. M-mode is displayed as horizontal lines on the screen. Various squiggly lines on the screen represent the changing depth of reflecting surfaces. If the line moves up and down, it indicates the reflector is moving closer and further away from the transducer. With pulse wave Doppler, the sonographer places a marker over the area you want to measure and the ultrasound system calculates the time of flight for the sound pulse traveling to and from the marker. This is displayed as waves on the screen. Over here on our left, you see just the squiggly lines like this, that is M mode. And the bigger pointier lines our pulse wave, this is when you normally hear the, shush, shush, the heartbeat that moms love to hear. Findings. M mode and pulse wave are both accurate when measuring on ultrasound examinations. In fetal echocardiography, M mode longitudinal motion has previously been described as a feasible measurement with good reproducibility and reference range, ranges have been published. 
This study was conducted on 341 fetuses. While this study was concentrated on fetal echocardiography exams, it can be assumed the MO would still be accurate for measuring heart rate during standard obstetric exams. Discussion and action plan. While ultrasound is not proven to have serious harm by biological effects, there is the theory of tissue heating causing biological harm for a vulnerable developing fetus. Tissue heating is less with M mode than that of pulse wave. M mode and pulse wave are both used to measure fetal heart rate. If M mode causes less tissue heating that can potentially interfere, interfere with the fetus, sonographers should only use M mode to measure fetal heart rate in obstetric ultrasounds. This should be universally implemented in departments and scanning protocols. Acknowledgements. First is Miss Jody Nutt. She's also my faculty advisor. She's been a great help in helping me tweak everything and guiding me in the right direction. Uh, Miss Amber Wooten and Miss Deanna Berryman are both ultrasound professors here. And they are my good guiding compass and kind of help me get ideas for this project. And um, thank you all for your time. Waffles, vegan waffles that increase nutrient intake, cognition, and immune system function. According to the literature, vegan diets can have many health benefits, but they may not contain all the necessary nutrients. This product's objective is to incorporate nutrients that both address vegan deficiencies and are free of allergies. The, pro the blend of ingredients includes choline, selenium, calcium, omega-3s, iron folate, vitamin D, and protein. These nutrients are essential for brain function, anemia, prevention, a healthy immune system, fertility, and sustainable energy. This project aims to address deficiencies in the vegan population and promote wellness in the non-vegan community. The product was presented to a focus group that consisted of a mixture of vegan and non-vegan participants and asked to eva evaluate the flavor, texture, and appearance preferences of both the savory and the sweet chocolate waffle. The dietetics profession may utilize the findings to meet Clients' dietary needs better and nourish their bodies. Our objective is to create a certified vegan product, and we are currently in the process of doing this through vegan.com. Um, so studies have shown that a vegan diet decreases the chances of insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, gastrointestinal disease, and a lot more. Since our waffles are made from plant-based products, the fiber content is also very high, and it keeps you full very long. Avoid um, intolerances and common allergies. So food allergies and intolerances are becoming more prevalent all around the world. The eight main allergens are shellfish, peanuts, milk, eggs, soy, wheat, tree nuts. Food allergies can cause life-threatening reactions, gastrointestinal stress, migraines, hives, itching, and more. And waffles is 100% allergen-free. Minimally processed and composed of whole foods promote cognition, anti-inflammation, and immune system functions, and also to avoid um, address vegan nutrient deficiencies. Our focus group testing was March 5th at the Arkansas State um, University Nutrition Science Lab. Um, an experiment was conducted using a focus group that consisted of A-State University students, faculty, staff members. Both the waffles and the competition waffle mix samples were randomly labeled and plated and then placed in front of their specified scorecards. Um, and also our waffles will be, was the preferred to the Birch Benders Keto Waffles. As Christian mentioned, waffles incorporate nutrients that both address vegan deficiencies and are free of allergies. In just one of our waffles, we have 25% the daily value of vitamin D, 15% the daily value of iron, 8% the daily value of folate, and 8% the daily value of selenium. And when one of our waffles also boasts 7 grams of protein with only 170 calories per waffle. Uh, so our findings show that out of the 16 participants, majority of them preferred our waffles to the competition waffles. So the price of our waffles were determined by the total cost of the raw ingredients of our waffles being $7.07, .07, and that is for an eight serving package. What we did is we 
added a 30% markup plus a 10% hidden fees markup. And we got the sales price of $15.54. In conclusion, many vegan products are highly processed, low in essential nutrients, and high in sugar and sodium. Our product is designed, designed to change the habit among ready-made vegan foods and create a wholesome, healthy alternative. Waffles will be sold at health food stores, served at health or health conscious restaurants, and eventually marketed on our website. A social media presence will also be established on Instagram and Facebook in order to further promote Waffles and their holistic, earth-friendly ideology. We would love to thank Mr. Eric West, Mr. Joseph Richman, and Ms. Taylor for able to guidance and support in completing our projects. Thank you. Hi, my name is Katherine Lambert. I am presenting on the importance of effective patient education in upper GI series fluoroscopy exams. My faculty advisor is Jody Nutt. This is an overall of my poster. So many patients who receive upper GI series fluoroscopy exams often receive breast treatment and this causes the procedure needed to be started over or rescheduled. Um, and patient education is important because um, that way the patient understands what's gonna be going on prevents the need for re-examinations and allows the radiolo radiologist to take accurate radiographs. So upper GI serious fluoroscopy exams use continual x-ray imaging to view the esophagus, stomach, and duodenum. And this exam is used to diagnose ulcers, GERD, inflammation, tumors, other structural problems such as hiatal hernias. Before a patient receives their exam, they need to do four things. If there's any chance of pregnancy, and if they have recently had a procedure that has required barium, they should notify the radiologist. The night before, they should not eat or drink anything after midnight. And finally, the patient should remove all clothing and jewelry and be given a gown prior to the beginning of the exam to prevent artifacts being imaged. So, Upper GI fluoroscopy exams begin with a patient swallowing barium crystals with a sip of water. This puts air in the stomach. Then they're given a cup of thick barium to drink, followed by a cup of thin barium. After the thin barium, they're given water to assess for reflux. And finally, they're given a barium tablet to assess for any narrowings in the esophagus. All throughout this, exam, they are turned in different positions and the radio, radiologist takes images. So patient, patient education is essential for accurate radiographs to be taken. The most effective way is, is to educate them through demonstrations and computer technology. It is essential for patients to understand and cooperate throughout the procedure. If the patient is unable to do so, this could lead to poor image quality, undiagnosable images, and an increase in patient dose. And patient dose should be kept to a minimum due to the potential of harmful effects. So according to previous research conducted, one of the most effective methods of patient education is through demonstrations. Allowing the patient to visualize the procedure eases patient anxiety and provides a more thorough understanding of the procedure. Another effective method is through visual technology, or computer technology. Computer technology includes video and audio tapes. So providing patients with these videos and demonstrations increases patient understanding and improves patient and technologist rapport. These methods have also been proven to relieve patient anxiousness and increase patient understanding. But most importantly, research has shown that the utmost effective method of patient education is using multiple methods. As a result, using one or the other, technologists should use computer technology and demonstrations to educate their patient. I would like to thank my mentor, Professor Jody Nutt, and my other teachers who have helped me and provided me with the background and the education to present. 
And those are my references. Hello, my name is Emily Marshall. Here I have my Create a Safe presentation for research I helped perform in the fall semester of 2020. The title of this project is In Vitro Bactericidal Effects of 415 Nanometer Blue Line on Tudomonas Originosa 19660. Introduction and Purpose Phototherapy or light therapy can be used to help treat many medical conditions that affect the skin. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a gram-negative bacilli bacterium. This bacterium is an environmental species and is naturally occurring in water and soil. An opportunistic pathogen, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, is a common cause of nosocomial infections. Pseudomonas aeruginosa can also be found in moist areas of clinical settings such as sinks and respiratory equipment. Objectives. This study is based on the use of blue light therapy to treat burn balloon infections. Pseudomonas aeruginosa was tested on brain heart infusion auger and treated with 415 nanometer blue light to measure the bactericidal effects of light exposure. Methods. 50 microliters of Pseudomonas aeruginosa stock, ATCC19660, was inoculated to 5 milliliters of brain heart infusion broth and incubated at 37 degrees Celsius for 18 to 24 hours. The Pseudomonas aeruginosa was then washed and resuspended in phosphate buffered saline. This was achieved by centrifuging the broth at 4,500 revolutions per minute for 10 minutes. The supernatant was removed using sterile pipettes and replaced with 5 milliliters of phosphate buffered saline. The solution was centrifuged again at the same speed and time, decanted and replaced with phosphate buffered saline. The solution was resuspended using a vortex. Three milliliters of the pseudomonas originosa solution was pipetted into a small petri dish to be treated with 415 nanometer blue light. The light therapy doses range from zero joules per centimeter squared to 60 joules per centimeter squared. Following the blue light exposure, 40 microliter aliquots of the treated pseudomonas originosa solution were transferred to brain heart infusion auger plates. These plates were incubated at 37 degrees Celsius for 18 to 24 hours. The pseudomonas originosa growth was then diluted. This was achieved by making a 0.5 McFarland standard using phosphate buffered saline and treated pseudomonas originosa colony growth. The 0.5 McFarland solution was diluted to 1 to 10,000 using a serial dilution. 10 microliter aliquots of the diluted solution were inoculated to new brain heart infusion auger plates and incubated at 37 degrees Celsius for 18 to 24 hours. Colony counts were performed following incubation. Findings. 415 nanometer blue light treatment inhibited in vitro growth of Pseudomonas aeruginosa on brain heart infusion auger. The highest dose of light had the greatest effect on bacterial growth. Here you can see a graph demonstrating the effect of the dosage of light therapy on the growth of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. We had three successful rounds of light treatment completed through to colony count. We also recorded our data from the control run on the graph, which included no light treatment of the Pseudomonas aeruginosa stock, as well as a dose of 60 joules per centimeter squared of light treatment. We used a control group with no light treatment to establish purity of the Pseudomonas aeruginosa stock and to obtain baseline colony counts. 60 joules per centimeter squared was the highest dose that our light instrument would let us apply. As you can see, the trend line in the graph has a negative slope, indicating that the Pseudomonas aeruginosa growth decreased inversely with the dosage of blue light treatment. In other words, the Pseudomonas aeruginosa colonies that had the highest doses of light had the least amount of colony growth on average. Discussion and action plan. The results of this study are promising for potential in vivo use of blue light therapy to treat wound infections. 
The next step following the study will be to inoculate the Pseudomonas aeruginosa strain to laboratory rats to measure the rate of burn wound healing in live subjects. Pseudomonas aeruginosa growth was affected by all dosages of light use, but growth of the Pseudomonas aeruginosa was inhibited most by the highest doses of light. The highest dose of light used in the study was 60 joules per centimeter squared because that is the highest dose of light treatment that is allowed for use on human subjects. The results of this study supported the data from other studies of a similar nature. Studies with similar subjects of experimentation investigated different factors that may affect the degree of bacterial inhibition, such as rate of delivery of light and the wavelength of light use. Other frequencies of light that have been researched range from 405 nanometers to 880 nanometers. Previous studies also tested other clinically significant bacterial species. Staphylococcus aureus, another common cause of nosocomial infections, was one species that was tested in previous studies. Propionbacterium acnes and Helicobacter pylori are two bacterial species that are not associated with clinical settings, but were also tested using light therapy. Acknowledgements. This research was funded with a grant by the name of the Use of Photobiomodulation to Treat Effective Wounds through the Arkansas Biosciences Institute. Much thanks to Zach McLean and Carly Farmer for their support and assistance in this study. Thank you also to Claude Rector, the instructor mentor over this project. Thank you for listening. Hello, my name is Tiffany, and today I'll be presenting the lead shielding controversy in medical imaging. Lead shielding is commonly used during medical imaging exams to protect patients and technologists from any harmful or unwanted radiation. The purpose of this research is to study the effectiveness of gonadal shielding specifically, which gonadal shielding is used to protect the reproductive organs from mutation, but studies have also found that radiation exposure today is much less than that from nearly a century ago. The purpose of this project is to examine and review gonad shielding effectiveness, and below that I put a picture that contains four different images. As you can see from left to right, more lead shield is being placed into the anatomy of interest, and the percentage being shielded is also increased. I used quantitative and qualitative research methods to uh, gather my information in regards to gonad shielding. And the first article I had is from GE Healthcare. They had a separate article that was included from the American Association of Physicians in Medicine, who were also for the discontinuation of gonadal shielding. They say that the shift from conventional to digital radiography lessened the need for gonadal shielding specifically, and the real controversy lies within the specific systems being used, such as automatic brightness control, which is used in fluoroscopy. It adjusts the brightness on the image automatically, uh, and then we have the automatic exposure control, which is used in radiography. It uh, shuts off the exposure once a preset exposure limit has been reached. And the third one is a DC, which is analog to digital, which is just converting analog signal to a digital signal. And the second one is from Advanced Health Education Center. They conducted a research on opinions from readers and they asked two separate questions. The first one is if they would continue shielding if a facility they worked at had changed policies about lead shielding. And 86% said that they would continue to shield even if their policy had changed. 9% would selectively shield and 1% would quit their jobs. And the second question was asked if patients should be protected from all medical radiation if possible, and readers voted again, 91% would follow ALARA as low as reasonably, reasonably achievable, and 7% believed some radiation was minimal, so no harm was really caused. The third one I did was the National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurements. They say the risk of heritable genetic effects are now considered to be much less than previously estimated, and technology improvements have resulted in a 95% reduction in absorbed dose. Gonadal shielding can interfere with the AEC systems, the automatic exposure control, which can also obscure parts of pelvic anatomy specifically where the gonads lie. 
and it concluded that in most circumstances, gonadal shielding does not reduce risk from exposure, but increase overall exposure to the patient. And the last one was a, uh, an article featuring Dr. McKinney and Dr. Gingold. Dr. McKinney said she was for the discontinuation of gonadal shielding, and Dr. McKinney said he was against the discontinuation of gonadal shielding. And Dr. McKinney said that evidence suggests that gonadal shielding is consi consistently employed incorrectly or it obscures the anatomy of interest and causes a repeat, which increases patient dose as well. She, increased, she discusses that digital imaging reduces dose and makes up for shielding mistakes. Dr. Gingold, on the other hand, says that he believes in as low as reasonably achievable ALARA and is a standard practice for dose optimization. It forms better patient understanding and cooperation as well. And in my findings, it's shown that shielding in the abdominopelvic region would possibly lead to mistakes being made, such as anatomy of interest being obscured, or even the potential for a, or for a patient to move before the image has been taken. So in conclusion, lead shielding of the gonads is still utilized in today's diagnostic imaging exams, but it is also a standard practice for the technologist when the exam allows. It has built trust and given the patient a sense of security in knowing that they are being properly treated. Thank you for watching. Hello, my name is Sarete Pites. I am the senior dietetic student here at A-State. For this project, we create one of the most favorite entree, which is South Spray Steak, that is entirely based on plant product, and it's targeted toward iron deficiency anemia. Introduction and purpose. Iron deficiency anemia is one of the most common health problems in the U.S. Around 4.5 to 18 percent of the U.S. population are iron deficient. Consuming animal product can help to get in the iron. However, excessive amount of animal product can develop cardiovascular disease, cancer, obesity, and other health complications. To combat the Complication, non-heme iron source can also help with iron deficiency anemia. Meanwhile, the research showed that the benefit of a um, benefit of plant-based diet ranging from preventing iron deficiency anemia, preventing obesity, lowering cardiovascular disease, and cancer risk. The purpose of this product is to help iron deficiency anemia adult population from 18 to 65 years old to get about 25% of iron from one serving of the plant-based house free state. Objective, we have to develop 100% plant-based house free state with similar experience, such as similar experience to the meat-based house free state, such as appearance, texture, flavor, and aroma. Next, we have uh, provide at least 25% of the daily recommended of iron. Method, this product, the main ingredient of this product are chopped portobello mushroom and mashed black bean because these two ingredients, they are, have a significant amount of iron. In order to achieve a firm meat-like texture, cornstarch, ground oat, and argo argo powder are used. Texturized vegetable protein, or TVP, also used because it plays a huge role in texture. It has a ground meat-like texture, while provide a significant amount of iron as well. This product can be cooked in oven, air fryer, or pan fry at 375 degrees Fahrenheit on, um, on, or on the medium heat for four minutes on each side. Hello, my name is Huyen Chen and I'm a senior of the dietetics program of A-State. Um, I wanna talk about the findings and results uh, of the products. This plant-based Salisbury steak uh, has a target population of adults from age 18 to 65 with iron deficiency anemia. Uh, the goal for us is to achieve about 25% of the daily recommended intake of iron, uh, which is from 8 to 15 milligrams, by providing a similar experience of traditional entrees with plant-based ingredients that are high in iron, 
fiber, protein, and other nutrients contents. This project aims to help the dietetics profession by bringing a new approach to nutrition intervention aspect of iron deficiency anemia. Uh, on the photo, you can see there's a final product of shocking Salisbury steak with and without gravy. Uh, as you can as you can see from the nutrition fact labels, uh, one serving size of the Salisbury steak contains 130 calories, 27 grams of protein, 9 grams of fiber, and 2 milligrams of iron. For this project, we have a focus group testing uh, with a scorecard. There's, there were 17 participants sample and rated the products based on, based on the scorecard. Uh, the scorecard has a, a hedonic scale that range from one to five, with one being the least favorable and five being uh, the most favorable, meaning the higher the score, the higher the rating. Uh, our, our research uh, shows that the average hedonic score uh, for the overall rating were 3.4. In conclusion, the result uh, shows that while there were some favorable features of this steak, such as flavor and appearance, uh, there are other factors that need to be improved, like texture and aroma to gain more recognition for a plant-based product. More than half believe that it is a good choice for an alternative Salisbury steak. Uh, additionally, the product contains more protein and fiber with no cholesterol and less fat than the meat-based Salisbury steak, making it a healthier and more desirable meal option. This food innovation project was being reviewed and evaluated closely by Dr. Richmond, Instructor West, and Instructor Taylor. Their contributions were greatly appreciated and acknowledged. This is the end of our presentation. Some presentations are the results of a classroom project, oral history, service training, assessment, journalism, or quality improvement activities. Such activities may have been deemed not to meet HHS OHRP definitions of human subject research designed to develop or contribute to generalizable knowledge and thus did not undergo IRB review. Hello, my name is Patricia Afflin. I am a senior MSN student with Focus and Family Nurse Practitioner. Today I'm going to be presenting on my quality improvement project um, related to written asthma action plans in the primary care setting and their value in patient self-management and outcomes. A little background about my project. Asthma is the most common chronic condition faced by children. It has a prevalence rate of 9.4% in children and 7.7% in adults, according to the CDC. Mortality rates are on a decline, but they remain at 10.5%, accounting for about 3,500 deaths annually. Asthma is an inflammatory process of the airways of the lungs that leads to difficulty breathing and poor gas exchange. If left untreated, it can result in life-threatening complications or even death. The problem with asthma is the treatment is not a one-size-fits-all. It requires individualized treatment. Written asthma action plans are formatted for providers to provide that individualization in the forms of education, monitoring, and treatment. There are recommendation of multiple clinical care guidelines, including the Global Initiative for, for Asthma, which is considered the golden standard for asthma management. This here is an example of a generalized format of a written asthma action plan. Usually they include a patient demographics and then a three-tier symptom or peak flow monitoring that's used to determine the proper treatment and intervention. This promotes a step-by-step, -step, simple way for patients to self or caretakers to take actions. It leads uh, to earlier interventions, which decreases the severity of exacerbations that could lead to complications or hospitalization. Despite the recommendations, providers are not all adopting this practice, which leads to the problem that I wanted to discuss in my project and that is that there is a significant deficiency in providers promoting, utilizing, and creating written asthma action plans. 
some rationales for non-compliance include that there's no standardized formatting. It can be a time-consuming process. And some believe uh, that the advancements in medicine are the sole reason for improved patient health. The purpose of my quality improvement project uh, was to evaluate and compare the compliance at a primary clinic in mid-northern Arkansas to the Healthy People 2020 target compliance goal of 36.8%. Healthy People 2020 is a program that's set out by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services that outlines goals and objectives for a 10-year improvement in health promotion and disease prevention. Asthma is a condition targeted within the program and written asthma action plans are a, our plans compliance is an identified target for improvement. My project was done utilizing a retrospective chart review of 50 patients seen from January, 2020 to January, 2021 with ICD-10 codes with a diagnosis related to asthma care management. The results are presented here. According to the gyna guidelines mentioned earlier, as well as many other medical resources, asthma is classified into four main categories based on symptom presence, severity, and frequency. Of the 50 charts reviewed, 12 patients were classified as having mild intermittent asthma, 25 with mild persistent asthma, 12 with moderate persistent asthma, and one with severe persistent asthma, and this patient was being co-managed with pulmonology specialists, which means that about 50% of the patients had mild persistent asthma. Interestingly, this is also the recommended point in care when daily maintenance medications and formal education is the most strongly recommended. However, as seen in the second chart, the highest percentage of patients do not receive a written asthma action plan until symptoms are in the moderate or severe category. Of the 50 charts reviewed, only six patients had a written asthma action plan, with a which brings the compliance rate for the clinic to 12%, which is significantly below the targeted goal of 36.8%. This project, along with others, have the potential to improve at asthma action care management. By raising awareness of the recommendation and the deficiency in compliance, there's a potential for improved compliance, which in turn improves patient understanding of their condition, their confidence and ability to self-manage their condition, which promotes an improved proper treatment, earlier treatment, and at the appropriate level of access treatment. And overall, the most important, it improves patient outcomes. Thank you. Hello, my name is Samantha Anderson, and I'm an FNP student at Arkansas State University. The title of my clinical project is a comparative analysis of hepatitis C screening. Are we missing the mark? So hepatitis C is a viral infection. It's actually systemic in nature, and it usually goes undetected until it's in the more advanced stages. There is no vaccine currently, but there is treatment for hepatitis C. It's an oral medication therapy. It usually lasts eight to 12 weeks in nature. It can be costly depending on insurance and other eligibility criteria. So changes in the screening guidelines through the USPSTF, these changes occurred in 2013. Prior to 2013, Anyone that was aged 56 to um, 75 was screened one time for hepatitis C. After 2013, the screening guideline changes uh, occurred, and now anyone that's over the age of 18 can get screened for hepatitis C for a one-time um, free charge, or more often if um, they have high-risk behaviors such as IV drug use or, or if there are other implications uh, that would indicate a need for hepatitis C testing. So the purpose is to compare the screening rates in adults. 
So prior to 2013, those screening guideline ages were different than the new guidelines, which is anyone that is 18 or over. And so I'm wanting to compare those two screening guidelines and see if actually the younger populations are getting screened as effectively as the older populations. Um, my hope is to educate and implement those new screening guidelines and it, hopefully it will improve um, outcomes. And if we can educate providers, patients, uh, nursing staff um, on the new guidelines according to the USPTSF, um, hopefully we can have better outcomes and more screening, effective screening for hepatitis C in the rural family clinic setting. So my methodology, I used a retrospective chart review. Um, 100 random patient charts were pulled for analysis. Um, they were pulled based on um, age, gender, uh, hepatitis C screening status. Um, those charts were pulled from January the 1st of 2017 through November the 18th of 2020. My exclusion criteria was anyone that had a current diagnosis of hepatitis C. So my results are actually still pending. I'm waiting on the facility to pull those charts so I can run the data to see what the significance of testing is between those two age groups with hepatitis C screenings. So contributions are providers following the USPSTF guidelines. I think that identifying if they're actually implementing those new guidelines in their office and testing those um, will hopefully improve outcomes for patients who are positive for hepatitis C so that it doesn't get to the advanced stage. So early screening prevents disease progression. So I want to make the providers aware of the new screening guidelines if they're not and hopefully encourage them to implement them into the electronic medical record. Thank you. My name is Kaylee Baltz. Baltz, Baltz, Baltz. I'm a nursing program at Arkansas State University in Jonesboro, Arkansas. My project is examining provider implementation of non-pharmacological interventions in patients diagnosed with hypertension. The purpose of this project um, first, I examined the implementation of patient education. This patient education could include any patient education at all about medications, dose changes, um, side effects, lifestyle interventions, like I said, any patient education whatsoever. Then I evaluated the implementation of JNC8 guidelines. So these guidelines indicate that those with pre or stage one hypertension within the ages of 40 to 59 years old should be educated about lifestyle modifications before they have a prescription to uh, reduce their blood pressure. So I examined the percentage of patients with hypertension who were educated about lifestyle modifications before or when they actually received their initial prescription. So a retrospective chart was, review was done and 50 patient charts were analyzed. Of these 50 patient charts, about four different providers were analyzed with their different techniques for providing patient education. So the time frame for these patient charts was January 2019 to December 2019. The inclusion cr criteria included adults within the ages of 40 to 59 years old, and they must have a diagnosis of pre or stage one hypertension. And this was indicated by the ICD-10 code of I-10. So of the 50 different patient charts reviewed, 45 of those patients were receiving a prescription to lower blood pressure. 32% of patient charts did not have any documentation that supported that education was provided at this visit. And this includes any education that I was talking about, about medications, dose changes, um, any, any type of education. But of those, only 12% of patient charts indicated that education regarding lifestyle modifications was provided. So this study highlighted that 
the uh, importance of provider documentation is essential. If you educate your patients about anything, you need to document it, whether it be about their medications or the lifestyle changes that they need to implement, which for uh, patients with hypertension, this can include smoking cessation, diet, exercise, um, especially in these rural areas, the patients do not know this information unless you tell them or you try and help them get the education that they need. They don't know what their daily caloric intake is or how much sodium they should be consuming every day unless you let them know. Um, but going on from that, just the importance of patient education in general those with blood pressure issues, they need patient education at almost every visit just because there is so much education that those with high blood pressure need. Um, so each visit, um, providing a little bit of that education at each encounter will help um, with, them, with their comprehension and them actually implementing that into their own life. So um, Going from that, the importance of education about lifestyle modifications to help reduce blood pressure is also essential. This is in JNC-8 guidelines. So um, these protocols are set for us providers to follow and to implement based on evidence-based research. So we need to implement lifestyle modification education because this is a really good way for patients to reduce blood pressure and without a medication. Even though they may need a medication later on if their blood pressure still is not below 140 over 90 or it is coming to that point, um, that's fine, but they can still implement the, the lifestyle modifications to help um, just improve their overall quality of life but also maintaining a healthy blood pressure. Hello, my name is Julie Bates, and I'm a family nurse practitioner student at Arkansas State University. And today I'll be presenting my Create a State project, which was a clinical research project that compares HIV screening at the local level to the national level. And this is in accordance with the United States Preventive Service Task Force guidelines. HIV is a significant burden to the healthcare system in America. Over 1 million people are affected by HIV. Um, however, only about 15 percent of those infected are unaware of their disease status. Consequently, 40 percent of new transmissions are transmitted by people who are unaware they were uh, infected. So increasing the rate of screening will ultimately reduce the cost of health care and the mortality that's associated with HIV and AIDS. The purpose of the study is to determine local compliance of the current HIV screening and compare that data to the national level. Uh, the intent of the study is to highlight some areas of potential improvement that will lead to increased screening, decreased transmission, and overall improved patient outcomes. Arkansas in the southern region of the United States has received some unwanted attention due to the high uh, rate of diagnoses. While we only account for 38% of the U.S. population, 45% uh, of all people living with HIV live in the southern United States, and over 50% of the new cases are um, found in the, United, in the southern part of the United States. Arkansas is one of seven states with some governmental funded uh, program initiative to help reduce HIV transmission. Patients who are screened for HIV and are found positive can be started on antiretroviral therapy, which has been shown to be very effective and can reduce the, trend, uh, the viral load to the point that it is virtually impossible to transmit HIV. So it's really important that healthcare providers uh, screen our patients so we know who to get started on therapy. Nationally, the current uh, screening rate for HIV is at 46%. Uh, Arkansas is a little bit lower at 38%, and this project is aimed at determining what the local screening rate is. If you can see the dark maroon color, it shows some of the higher prevalence, which is throughout the southern region and then uh, scattered throughout se several counties within Arkansas. Ashley County, where this project takes place, is uh, referenced with the star. 
nationally um, or the current national guidelines are for patients ages 15 to 65 to undergo routine HIV screening. And this is for the non-pregnant population. The PICO used to guide this uh, research is listed here. Are asymptomatic non-pregnant patients between the ages of 15 and 65 being properly screened for HIV comparative to the national average of 46%? So the methodology was a 50 patient um, retrospective chart review and uh, patients included in the denominator were ages 15 to 65 non-pregnant and anyone who had had a wellness exam within the 2019 calendar year. Patients were included in the numerator if they had a uh, HIV screen or if they had one recorded um, in their electronic health record. Uh, participant data regarding the race and sex of those who were included in the uh, re chart review is listed here. And as you can see, uh, the clinic had a 2% uh, screening rate for the year of 2019. There was a 6% uh, screen rate of ever tested um, during the year of 2019. So significantly below the both state and national level. <clears throat> Some additional research findings uh, included the discovery of probable missed, uh, missed opportunities by looking at some other screening tests like STD and, and hepatitis C. If the clinic were to co-screen, we would they would have been able to increase their rate to about 20%. So moving forward with the information from this research project, um, the clinic has an awareness of their performance against the national standard with the research and data that was presented, they can see the benefit in taking steps towards compliant with HIV screening. And lastly, the research project provided a goal for the clinic, which included changing clinical algorithms to increase to include uh, co-screening for HIV with any STD or hepatitis C screening, as these diseases tend to place the uh, patient at an increased risk for HIV. References for this slide presentation can be viewed by accessing the Google document listed here. Thank you. Hi guys, my name is Samuel Bentley and the title of my project is an examination of referral rates for cardiac calcium screenings within a rural health setting. The purpose of this project was to examine the use of routine cardiac calcium screens uh, for primary prevention in a local family practice clinic of Mountain Home, Arkansas. Heart disease causes about 600,000 deaths a year. It's the leading cause of death in both men and women. Heart disease is basically from poor lifestyle choices, such as smoking, uh, poor diet, and lack of exercise. The symptoms can build up, the plaque builds up, um, over a period of time causing blockages that can lead to a heart attack. So with cardiac calcium screens, there are a specialized CAT scan, which takes pictures of the patient's coronary arteries, their coronary circulation, and just the overall anatomy of their heart. Uh, they offer incidental findings as well, like pulmonary nodules can be seen on these screens and can help diagnose lung cancer. So that's a benefit of calcium screens as well. They're also cheap, they're non-invasive, and they just do an overall good job with diagnosing. So the American Heart Association recommends patients uh, screening at 55 to 80 years old and patients at a younger age if they have high risks such as family history of heart disease or diabetes or hypertension and hyperlipidemia as well. So the research for this project consisted of a chart review of 50 patient charts at the local clinic in Mountain Home. Um, out of these 50 patients, they had to be 55 to 80 years old, have a history of smoking, hypertension, high cholesterol, or diabetes. Uh, patients that were excluded in this exam consisted of patients that already had previous cardiac stents or heart attacks. 
So out of the 50 patient charts, only 18 patients had been referred for cardiac calcium screens. And out of those 18 patients, five actually had a significant risk and required heart catheterization with stents placed. Findings of this project should help providers understand the benefits of cardiac calcium screens for routine prevention. Also show providers how well they're meeting national guidelines set forth by the American Heart Association and increase the routine use of these screening tools in at-risk patients and overall decrease the number of deaths from heart disease. Thank you guys. Hello, my name is Jonna Boggs. I'm one of the graduate family nurse practitioner students here at Arkansas State University. My project is over colorectal cancer, an analysis of screening rates within the rural healthcare setting. Colorectal cancer is the third leading cause of death in the United States amongst men and women, according to the United States Preventative Services Task Force. The review is over fecal occult blood test screening measures in patients at the age of 50 to 74 years in a local primary care office of Northeast Arkansas comparative to the national standard recommended by the United States Preventative Services Task Force. The colon sheds normal and abnormal cells daily through stool. Cologuard is a fecal occult screening tool that can be used to detect certain DNA markers or blood. It is FDA approved, therefore we can see precancerous cells and cancer cells within stool studies. These stool studies can be done at the convenience of the patient at home and sent to the company by the patient. At the office, they are offered this screening. They sign forms and paperwork. And then all of this is mailed to the company and the company does notify the provider when samples are collected and when results are known. When the results are known, this allows the care provider to follow up with the patient for potential further screening options if abnormal cells are found, or to set up the next appropriate screening time frame. The method to review this was a retrospective review of 100 patient charts from January 2019 to December 2019. It was done on the Medicare wellness visit at random selection. The ICD-10 codes, which is a billing code and international classification of disease database, numbers were used. A G0438 or G0439, which is an annual wellness visit billing code was obtained. A K62.5, which is hemorrhage of anus and rectum. And a Z12.11, which is encounter for screening for malignant neoplasm of colon was used to gather data. The inclusion criteria had to meet 50 to 74 years of age, no prior history of cancer, colorectal polyps, or first relative family history of cancer. The results within this clinic show that 60% of patients at those well screening visits or that had those ICD-10 codes were offered colorectal screening through Cologuard. 100% of patients were offered a colonoscopy, which is considered gold standard for colorectal cancer screening because it allows for visualization of the colon and can allow for some invasive testing if abnormal tissues are discovered. Along with this, the United States Presentative Task Force Services does recommend annual screening and well care visits through Medicare is also offered at annual intervals. The clinic has an electronic medical record that allows them to have cues that pop up when they need to screen patients again for the colorectal screening. And it also gives them the opportunity to see if a colonoscopy or other screening measures for colorectal cancer were completed or performed. Also, the results can be found within this electronic medical record system. Contribution to practice for this review was increased non-invasive screening could increase screening measures to patients if we use a stool sample 
it's done in the patient's home and allows for them to have a non-invasive screening if they are low to moderate risk, according to United States Presented Task Force Services. The screening can also identify need for further testing if abnormal results are noted. It can assist the clinic and other local clinics in meeting national standards and screening for colorectal cancer and therefore allow us to establish an early detection plan and program for colorectal cancer. These are the references. I hope you've enjoyed this review. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Sherry Janae Brandon and I'm a graduate student in the College of Nursing and Health Professions, focusing on a family nurse practitioner. The title of my project is Chlamydia and Gonorrhea Screening Recommendations for Women, an Analysis. The purpose of my project was to determine the local rates for annual chlamydia and gonorrhea screenings in sexually active women aged 24 and younger compared to the national average screening rate. Why is this important? Um, sexually transmitted infections are a major health concern across all demographics um, in all geographical areas. Among these infections, the most common are chlamydia and gonorrhea. As recently as 2017, there were 1.7 million cases of chlamydia and over 583,000 reported cases of gonorrhea in the United States alone. Um, there's even estimates that the number of cases are actually more than that. These are simply the reported cases. Um, chlamydia and gonorrhea often occur together and can actually cause lasting health effects, particularly to females um, ages 15 through 24. Those can be nausea, vomiting, fever, a vaginal discharge, painful intercourse, pelvic inflammatory disease, and eventually even for infertility. Um, other startling statistics are approximately one out of every four sexually active women, uh, young women in particular, have had or will have a sexually transmitted infection. Did you get that? Approximately one out of every four sexually active young females have had or will have a sexually transmitted infection. Of those, 40% of them will then be reinfected within only a few months. So given all these statistics, after a systematic review of evidence in 2014, the United States Preventative Services Task Force recommended an annual screening for these infections in all young women um, 24 and under. So why is it uh, so simple? Why do I think it's so simple to even do those screenings? Because the screening kits cost as little as $3 each, and they can be done simply um, through a urinalysis or a vaginal swab. Treatment and cure can be accomplished with just a short course of antibiotics, usually costing less than $30. For methodology, this study was conducted by utilizing a retrospective chart review with random sampling of well woman visits. 50 charts were randomly selected from the electronic medical record, then reviewed to include all sexually active females ages 24 and younger who had been seen in the clinic then from January 1st of 2020 to November 1st of 2020. The data was used to compare the chlamydia and gonorrhea screening rate at that local clinic to the national average rate of screening. So how did we do Northeast Arkansas? Once the data was collected and analyzed, the Northeast Arkansas clinic was found to have only a 22% chlamydia and gonorrhea screening rate for qualified patients. Uh, this is compared to the already low national average screening rate of 48.9%. So 
So even though um, these numbers are not what we hope for, um, there is still good that can come out of it. We can make clinicians aware of the deficit in the local screening rate, which would then um, encourage the clinicians to be more diligent in performing these screenings, um, which leads the way to treatment and prevention of these infections in the young women of our community. So I thank you for listening and um, I hope that this has meant something to you and you learned something about how common these infections are, yet how easily treatable they are and do your part. If you're a one young woman seeking care, then ask for the screening. Again, thanks for listening. Hello, my name is Chelsea Brinks. The quality improvement project that I completed and will be presenting today is evaluation of a rural clinic's compliance with bone density screening in women age 65 and greater. So osteoporosis is a big issue here in the United States, affecting over 12 million Americans annually, leads to fractures, chronic pain, reduced independence, and a decreased quality of life overall. Up to 30% of individuals who suffer from an osteoporotic hip fracture will not survive 12 months post-fracture, and 71% of all osteoporotic fractures occur in women. Due to the increased risk with age, the United States Preventative Services Task Force recommends that all women have initial bone densitometry screening at age 65 or greater. The gold standard bone densitometry screening here in the United States is DEXA scan. It's a painless procedure that can be completed in one office visit. Medicare does reimburse for DEXA screening every 24 months for individuals who are considered at risk. The purpose of my quality improvement project is to investigate the rates of DEXA screening in female patients age 65 or greater at a clinic in Northeast Arkansas, as compared to the national average for Medicare enrollees of 79.3%, as reported by the United States Preventative Services Task Force. So to gather data for my quality improvement project, I performed a retrospective chart review at a family practice clinic that's located here in Northeast Arkansas. Using the clinic's electronic medical record platform, 50 patient charts were sampled from patients who had visited the clinic between January 1, 2020 and December 31st, 2020. Inclusion criteria included obviously female gender, age 65 or greater, and a record of at least one in-office visit between 1-1-2020 and 12-31-2020. Additional aggregated data included the patient's race, the last um, DEXA scan date, applicable ICD-10 coding, and whether or not the patient had documented history of osteoporosis diagnosis prior to the most recent DEXA scan. So my results, um, overall, I found a DEXA rate of 50%. That is 25 out of 50 charts that I reviewed. Um, so data, data was collected from the electronic medical record and recorded, organized, and analyzed using Microsoft Office Excel statistical software. Analysis of the data, as I said, revealed a screening rate of 50%. Dif demographic data revealed that 96%, or 48 out of 50, of the patients were white, 2%, 1 out of 50, were Hispanic, and 2%, one out of 50, were black. DEXA screening rate for the white females was 52%, 25 out of 48, 100% for Hispanics, one out of one, and 100% for black females, one out of one. Of the cohort, 16%, or eight out of 50, had documented history of osteoporosis diagnosis prior to the most recent documented DEXA scan. So the results of my quality improvement project provide valuable statistical, statistical data that may be used by providers at this clinic, managers at this clinic, 
to improve upon the DEXA screening rate in women age 65 or greater here in Northeast Arkansas. Increasing this DEXA screening rate in this patient population will identify those at risk for falls, osteoporotic fractures, and decreased quality of life. Decreasing this fall and risk fracture in this patient population will decrease the rate of osteoporotic fractures or result in preservation of independence, decrease chronic pain, like I said, an increased quality of life and overall better outcomes. Thank you. My name is Nathan Burns and the title of my project is a comparative analysis of depression screening rates in inpatients 13 to 25 years of age within an urban health population. Major depression's growing prevalence among adolescents and young adults is alarming. However, the majority of depression symptoms could be diagnosed early and treated to prevent severe depression and its complications. Depression has always been associated with an increase in the rate of functional impairment and suicide. Due to this, the USPSTF conducted a wide range of different research studies on what screening tool would be best when it comes to screening for depression. By incorporating a standard depression screening into every health assessment, symptoms of depression could be identified sooner and treated at an early stage before suicide is a factor. The PHQ-9 and PHQ-2 is one of the most popular and effective screening tools used to evaluate the depression rate among individuals regardless of their personal characteristics and backgrounds. The purpose of this quality improvement project was to inspect early screening tools and their efficacy for depression in teenagers and adolescents as it aimed at the population of teenagers and young adults ranging between the ages of 13 and 25 years old. Screening for depression is not a standard assessment for every pr primary care provider. However, systematic screening of depression in primary care settings that have adequate follow-up and treatment is recommended. The total for all types of depression comes to 15.3% to 22% of all patients seen in primary care offices. And studies show that primary care provision for physicians who provide the usual care fail to recognize depressive symptoms in 30 to 50% of patients with depression. The prevalence of adults with a major depressive episode was highest among individuals aged 18 to 25 at 13.1%, which they could be classified as young adults. Not far behind that number were individuals aged 12 to 17, as in 2017 estimated 2.3 million adolescents aged 12 to 17 in the United States had at least one major depressive episode, which represents 9.4% of the U.S. population in that age range. Among young adults aged 18 to 25 in Arkansas, the annual average percentage of serious thoughts of suicide in the past year has not changed since 2008. The annual average prevalence of, this past, of the past year of suicide rates in Arkansas was 7.5%, similar to the regional average of 7.6% and the national average of 8.5%. A retrospective chart review of approximately 100 pa patients who visited the clinic between the dates of July 1st, 2020 and November 5th, 2020 was conducted. Data collection included patient gender, race, and age, and whether or not the patient was screened for depression as part of the appointment. Inclusion criteria were patients aged 13 to 25 who had at least one of the following ICD-10 codes as shown on the screen. Exclusion criteria were all patients over the age of 25 or under the age of 13 and did not have one of the ICD-10 codes as shown on the screen. By using a quantitative approach, a comparison of the number of adolescents and young adults who were screened and treated to the number of teens who were not screened and treated was made. 100 patients were selected at random by assigning a number to each patient chart and loading them into a random selector tool. The findings show that 100% efficacy in diagnosing, diagnosing depression when using the PHQ-2 or PHQ-9. The clinic also had an 83% depression screening rate, 17%, however, were not screened for depression during their visit, and 63% of the time, a PHQ-2 or PHQ-9 was used as a screening tool. 100% of treatment was initiated after a depression diagnosis. Contribution. The project encouraged the implementation of systematic screening of early depression to be generalized in every visit. It also suggests that there should be a focus on screening the younger population as studies have detected that risk of suicide attempts generally declined with age. Final thoughts. First, standard depression screening tools such as the PHQ-2 and PHQ-9 should be implemented in every primary care clinic as shown great results when it comes to screening and diagnosing depression. These tools can be handed out at patient check-in and the PHQ-2 is a fast way to 
see if depression symptoms are occurring with the patient. With the pandemic, the feeling of isolation is only increased, so I expect those numbers of suicide attempts, rates, and depression to increase. FMPs can be part of the solution by doing formal assessments for all patients by using a screening, a standardized screening depression tool. Thank you. Welcome, my name is Teresa Clark and I will be presenting my Doctorate of Nursing Practice Project Improving Medication Reconciliation Quality During Long-Term Acute Care Transitions of Care. The purpose of this project is to systematically improve the medication reconciliation process during all transitions of care by providing essential education to all involved staff members, incorporating the use of the standardized medication reconciliation toolkit to enhance the process, and of course, by evaluating the innovation outcomes. Transition of care occurs when a patient transitions from one level of care to another. During every transition of care, a formal medication reconciliation should be performed to ensure medication accuracy and prevent patient harm. The more transitions of care a patient experiences, of course, the higher the risk for medication discrepancy occurring. Thorough literature review was conducted and uses systematic peer-reviewed articles from credible sources. Literature shows that standardized or systematic methods of medication reconciliation has lower discrepancy rates and higher patient outcomes. Development of medication reconciliation toolkit can enhance the delivery of high quality care. Diffu Rogers' diffusion of innovation theory was used to guide the impl and implement this proposed change. A needs assessment um, was performed. Medication reconciliation accuracy is a worldwide issue. During the needs assessment, it was noted that Arkansas Continued Care Hospital does not currently have a systematic medication reconciliation process in place. A standardized medication reconciliation process is, in need, is needed to enhance the quality of care and improve patient outcomes. So as you can see in the illustration above, the pre-implementation phase, we give a, um, a pre-test and that was just to determine a baseline data of this nursing staff's knowledge. Then the implementation of the newly designed medication reconciliation toolkit was introduced. Post test was given to, that way we could determine the accuracy of our level of success of the education. And then of course, the follow-up, the results are still pending at this time completion. The algorithm, this, al this illustration is the algorithm used to analyze the medication reconciliation in 20 charts to determine the accuracy. A retrospective study was used to complete this analysis and gather this data. During the analysis, the first step was to determine if the medication reconciliation was accurate or inaccurate. Even if it was not, then the process continued through these steps of the algorithm. Who was accountable for the incompleteness and what type of discrepancy was identified? This algorithm provided a step-by-step -step guide to conduct the analysis on each medication reconciliation. Descriptive statistics was utilized to collect this data. As you can see in the pie chart above, that is a representation of the 20 charts that were analyzed. Three revealed an accurate and complete process with no identified discrepancies. 13 of them lacked verification of medication reconciliation. Six had noted dosing errors. Five were found to have missing stop dates. And an additional six were noted to have omissions or duplications of medication. Based on these findings, an enhanced medication reconciliation process is needed to enhance the quality of care and patient safety. This is a quality improvement project. The methods that were used, of course, were the pretest, the post-test, the education, which was PowerPoint, the systematic process, which was the medication reconciliation toolkit. A PowerPoint presentation on medication reconciliation background was, and significance was given to all the involved staff. The goal was to expand their understanding and knowledge on the importance of the accurate medication reconciliation and with the new medication reconciliation process that was included. Post-test was administered after the education to measure the level of success. The newly designed reconciliation was introduced and implemented. After implementation, the additional 20 charts will be analyzed to gather the data to determine the success. The same algorithm will be used as the guide to determine um, the accuracy and to guide the analysis. Inferential statistics is being used to gather the post-implementation data. The results, barriers such as inclement weather, the COVID pandemic, as well as the chief nursing officer vacancy has all impacted the conclusion of the study. The post-implementation phase of this project is currently in process. To date, eight charts have been evaluated post-implementation. 12 charts remain to be analyzed. Of those eight that have been reviewed, six have shown complete 
uh, accuracy completed entirely. Two were incomplete, resulting in 75% accuracy, 25% inaccuracy. Therefore, the project to date is showing to be successful. Free implementation data resulted in 85% inaccuracy. Additional follow-up is expected to result in a higher increase in accuracy and completion of the medication reconciliation process. The contributions of this study. Innovation should target evidence-based practice, improve patient safety, health outcomes, and enhance the overall delivery of healthcare. Improving quality of medication reconciliation by improving a standardized toolkit can achieve all of the above. Translating evidence into practice signifies doctorate of nursing practice level of work competency. Evidence reveals a systematic toolkit improves accuracy of medication reconciliation. Improving quality can decrease length of stay, early readmission rates, improve patient safety and satisfaction, as well as be cost effective. This contributes to practice to ensure the delivery of high quality care. Here is a link to my references on a Google Doc. This completes my presentation. I appreciate your time and of course your attention. Hi, my name is Kylie Claypool, and the title of my project is an analysis of a primary care clinic's annual diabetic foot examination rate in patients with diabetes age 40 to 65. The purpose of my quality improvement project was to examine the rate at which these patients with diabetes were receiving an annual foot exam at this clinic. I felt this was an important to examine as my background is actually chronic wound care and I know the other side of what can happen with untreated diabetic foot ulcers if they're not caught early. Diabetes is the leading cause of foot ulcers and amputations. They are a huge driver of healthcare spending because they can cause significant damage and require ongoing care for months or even years. Each time a diabetic foot exam is performed, you can provide early detection of foot ulceration, ulceration and sensory changes, which could lead to reducing limb-threatening complications if things are caught early. This is why the American Diabetes Association recommends a comprehensive foot evaluation, at least annually, to identify risk factors for ulcers and amputations. So who needs a foot exam done? Well, every patient with diabetes should have their feet inspected at every visit, ideally, and a comprehensive foot evaluation at least annually to identify risk factors for ulcers and any changes. This is an important objective from Healthy People 2020. They want to increase the rate at which patients with diabetes age 18 and older have at least one foot exam every year. The methodology used was a retrospective chart review of 50 patients with diabetes age 40 to 65 um, between the dates of January 1st, 2020 through November 5th, 2020. I reviewed approximately 50 charts and found that 39 out of the 50 charts had a documented foot exam. I did not find a correlation between age or insurance, such as Medicaid versus Medicare, um, as to why these were missed during the calendar year, but it did seem that quite a few of them that were missed had multiple comorbidities and they had been in and out of the hospital that year. I feel that my findings um, were able to benefit the clinic as I discussed with the clinic the percentage that were completed versus not completed and the complexity of those patients. Overall, I think the, the clinic did fairly well, um, but they could still improve, especially on the high acuity patients they are at risk for being missed. Uh, and it'll be important to watch for those alerts that come to the electronic medical record that remind them the foot exams are due. It's important to complete these as recommended by the American Diabetes Association and Healthy People 2020. Because like I said before, prevention is key to make sure these patients don't develop an ulcer that could ultimately cost the patient their limb or their life. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. Hello, my name is Brandi Cooper and my quality improvement project is screening for preeclampsia at prenatal visits. The purpose of my quality improvement project is to examine the attainment of blood pressures on pregnant women at each prenatal appointment to screen for preeclampsia. This was done at a local OBGYN clinic in Paragould, Arkansas. Preeclampsia is the second leading cause of maternal mortality rates worldwide. Preeclampsia not only affects maternal mortality, it also affects infant or fetal mortality rates. 
approximately 76,000 maternal deaths and 500,000 infant or fetal deaths worldwide annually can be contributed to preeclampsia. Approximately one in 12 pregnancies can be affected. In the United States, preeclampsia accounts for approximately 9% of maternal deaths, 6% of preterm births, and 19% of medically induced preterm births. Screening and early detection greatly reduce maternal and infant or fetal mortality rates. The United States Preventative Service Task Force recommends evaluating blood pressures at all prenatal appointments for all women as the current recommendation for screening of preeclampsia. I conducted a retrospective chart review to evaluate 50 charts for, of prenatal records for patients in the clinic from January 2019 to November of 2020. I did this to determine if a blood pressure was obtained at each appointment in women with a diagnosis of preeclampsia. The number of prenatal appointments for each patient was compared to the number of prenatal appointments with a blood pressure taken to determine the percentage of adherence. The inclusion criteria included pregnant, female, prenatal appointment visit with ICD-10 code of preeclampsia and an active patient seen in the clinic between January 1, 2019 and November 5, 2020. Exclusion criteria included non-pregnant females, males, patients without a diagnosis of preeclampsia, and patients seen outside of the dates of January 1, 2019 and November 5, 2020. My quality improvement project showed results of a 76% adherence to the recommendation by the local OBGYN clinic providers. 38 out of 50 charts revealed that each patient had had a blood pressure obtained at each prenatal appointment. Out of the 12 charts that did not have a blood pressure obtained at each appointment, seven of those lacked a blood pressure during a single appointment where all other appointments had a blood pressure obtained. The five remaining charts did not have a blood pressure obtained at each prenatal appointment and were more varied in the number of appointments where a blood pressure was not obtained, with the average range being two to seven appointments without a blood pressure obtained. Here's a chart to show each prenatal each patient and the number of prenatal appointments and the number of times their blood pressures were obtained at those prenatal appointments. I hope that this quality improvement project contributes to current practice. The introduction of telehealth visits in prenatal care during the COVID-19 pandemic has greatly impacted my results. Some prenatal appointments were conducted telehealth, therefore they did not have a blood pressure obtained. By bringing these results to the attention of the providers, that we can lead to increased awareness of preeclampsia screening and increased adherence to the current recommendation. Based on risk factors, blood pressures obtained at each appointment and the patient's own symptoms, we can continually monitor them throughout their pregnancy for preeclampsia, either in office or a combination of telehealth and in office appointments. By trending blood pressures at early prenatal appointments, we can determine if telehealth visits are an option during that pregnancy or if they should continue with all in person appointments based on the trends in their blood pressures, their symptoms, and their individual risk factors. I've included a list of my references. Thank you and have a nice day. Hi, my name is Randy Davis. Today I will be providing an overview of my DNP scholarly project titled Implementation of an Evidence-Based COPD Assessment Tool in Primary Care. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD is a group of diseases such as emphysema and chronic bronchitis that result in airflow blockage in the lungs and difficulty breathing. It is a chronic illness that is often diagnosed in individuals with repetitive respiratory complaints. Usually by the time a diagnosis is made, the disease course has already progressed to at least a moderate level. Because the COPD is often insidious onset, it is frequently diagnosed and treated by primary care providers. Studies have shown, unfortunately though, that there is typically poor adherence to guideline-based COPD care for patients managed in the primary care setting. The purpose of this project is to implement an evidence-based screening tool for individuals at risk and with known diagnosis of COPD to ensure Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease or GOLD guidelines and treatment recommendations are being followed in a rural family practice clinic in Northeast Arkansas. This quality improvement project consists of a retrospective chart review pre and post implementation of provider education related to implementation of the COPD assessment test and COPD management algorithm. The COPD assessment test, or CAT, is a valid and reliable screening tool recommended for current goal guidelines. 
The setting consists of six clinic locations belonging to a group of family practice primary care clinics located in Northeast Arkansas. A convenient sample of patient records seen at participating clinic locations was utilized for this project. Inclusion criteria included individuals, both male and female, aged 40 to 75 with a history of smoking. This could be current or former smokers, as well as individuals with or without a diagnosis of COPD. Charts for each participating clinic location were reviewed prior to provider education related to the implementation of the CAT questionnaire uh, to identify percentages of active patients with documented smoking history, as well as percentage with COPD diagnosis. Post-implementation will review, will compare these percentages. This is the modified CAT questionnaire utilized for this project. As you can see, there are eight questions based on severity of symptoms. The modifications consist of the questions regarding smoking history, as well as a statement at the bottom that uh, regarding a score of 10 or above, which is considered a positive finding according to gold guidelines and warrants consideration of further evaluation or treatment. This questionnaire is utilized during the visit intake uh, for patients who are current or former smokers. This is the COPD management algorithm that providers were educated on. It covers selection of inhaled therapies utilized in treating COPD. It was developed in accordance with current goal guidelines. Providers were encouraged to use this algorithm to assist with the management of their patients with COPD. This is the timeline to date for the project. This is an ongoing project as all phases have not yet been completed. Uh, due to issues related to the COVID-19 pandemic as well as inclement weather this past month, as for the overall project, pre-implementation data has been obtained. Data was collected from charts for patients meeting inclusion criteria with clinical encounters between October 1st, 2020 and February 5th, 2021. For a total of 1,992 patients between all six clinic locations, 23% were documented as former smokers, 31% were current smokers, and only 10% had a documented diagnosis of COPD. It is anticipated that the percentage of patients with a documented diagnosis uh, will increase after the provider education related to implementation of the CAT screening as well as COPD management algorithm. At the time of this recording, post-implementation results are not available. Providers have been educated regarding implementation of the tools and are utilizing them in practice. Post-implementation data collection has been scheduled and final results will be available at the time of the Create a State Symposium in April. Primary care providers need to be educated on interventions targeted at earlier identification of COPD, as well as improved management in accordance with current evidence-based guidelines. As a DMP prepared advanced practice nurse in the primary care setting, I have gained the leadership knowledge and skills to guide this change by not only educating other providers in the practice on the gap that exists, but also a feasible solution to address it. I have experienced growth both professionally and personally that enables me to collaborate with management to incorporate changes within the patient encounter workflow to address this gap in care. Potential implications for practice gained from this scholarly project include earlier recognition of COPD, increased adherence to guidelines for COPD management, and improved patient outcomes within the practice. And this concludes my presentation and thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Kaylin Fain and I'm a graduate nursing student with my focus in family nurse practitioner. My project that I'm gonna be presenting to you is comparing diabetic foot exam guidelines to prevent diabetic foot ulcers. Diabetes contributes to nearly 80% of all non-traumatic amputations that are performed in the United States each year. The American Diabetes, Diabetes Association recommends screening of neurological, vascular, dermatological, and musculoskeletal status of people with diabetes annually. The goal of routine diabetic foot exams is to not only prevent diabetic foot ulcers, but help to aid in decreasing the cost spent on this complication and decrease the number of visits to the emergency department. In 2015, nearly $1.8 billion was spent by emergency departments caring for patients with diabetic foot ulcers in the United States. This is not including inpatient charges. This is just patients who have been seen in the ER, treated in the ER, and then discharged. So $1.8 billion was spent just on taking care of patients with diabetic foot ulcers. 
The International Diabetes Foundation states that it has been estimated that less than one third of physicians recognize the symptoms of diabetic per peripheral neuropathy, even when it is symptomatic and discuss them with their patients. International Working Group of Diabetic Foot Guidance of 2015 states that there are five key elements that guide prevention efforts for foot problems in patients with diabetes. And these include identification of the at-foot, at-risk foot, at foot, excuse me. So someone, for example, with neuropathy, regular inspection and examination of the at-risk foot and education of patient, family, and healthcare providers, routine wearing of appropriate footwear and treatment of, of pre-ulcerative signs. The purpose of this quality improvement project is to evaluate the adherence of a local family practice clinic in Paragold, Arkansas to the American Diabetes Association recommendations of annual foot exams for diabetic patients due to the increased risk of this patient population developing foot ulcers. So why is this important? Many of the patients that clinicians see in the state of Arkansas have diabetes. Um, and if you haven't, you're going to. Um, that's why performing preventative exams with these patients is critical to prevent complications of this disease. Development of foot ulcers is a problem in patients with diabetes, and I believe there's a way that we can help decrease the number of patients suffering from this complication. A retrospective chart review with randomized sampling was performed at a primary clinic in Northeast Arkansas. 50 charts were selected at random from the electronic medical record of patients that visited the clinic between January 1st, 2019 and January 1st, 2020. Search criteria included patients that were aged 40 to 75 years old. So anyone less than 40 or anyone above 75 was not included in this, um, in this project. Patients that were seen January, between January 1st, 2019 and January 1st, 2020, and patients with a clinical diagnosis of type one or type two diabetes. These were the results of my chart review was that 12 out of 50 charts had a documented foot exam. Documented foot exams included neurological, vascular, dermatological, and musculoskeletal status of patients according to the ADA recommendations. So that comes out to only 24% of the charts that selected had a documented foot exam, leaving 76% without a documented foot exam. According to the American Diabetes Association, 14.8% of the population of Arkansas has diabetes. So that's a huge number. We're talking nearly 360,000 people that have a diagnosis of diabetes. As I said before, if you haven't seen one, someone in practice with this diagnosis, you're going to if you have not already. Performing these annual exams is, per, is important in clinic visits because it can decrease the cost and rate of diabetic foot complications. Early assessment is key to prevention as with many diseases. Results of this project can bring attention to the importance of routine care, increase referrals to specialty care, and make for a greater quality of life for diabetic patients. What I hope that you can take from this presentation is that diabetic foot exams are easy for clinicians to perform and they're necessary. But another point is that we can educate our patients to perform these exams at home. We can even involve, whether it's the patient's spouse, kids, family members, that they can help the patient perform these exams. You know, something as simple as to a diabetic person, oh, I need to take my blood sugar. I think it's time that we need to normalize. I need to check my feet. I need to inspect my feet and even do it once a month. You know, the, the ADA recommends that clinicians do a full inspection once a year. Well, that's a lot of time that, you know, whether an injury can happen or, or whatever, you know, that can affect the foot, these people at home can even just do this something, like I said, is once a month. So thank you so much for listening. Good morning, my name is Callie Feather and I'm a graduate student studying family nurse practitioner. The title of my presentation is Comparing Trends of Tobacco Cessation Counseling Implementation. Tobacco smoking is the leading cause of preventable death in the United States, and over 8 million people die each year from tobacco use. The CDC has reported that tobacco use is not only, only the leading cause of preventable death, but also disability in the United States, proving its importance to healthcare education. 
Tobacco use has also been found to cost the United States over $131 billion each year in medical expenses. And right now, over 32.4 million people or 13.7% in the United States population use tobacco products. Specifically in Arkansas, we are ranked the sixth worst state in terms of tobacco use. Ultimately, primary care providers are among the front line to educate patients on these risks of smoking and encouraging them to make decisions to quit smoking through tobacco cessation counseling. The United States Preventative Services Task Force recommends healthcare professionals utilize the 5A framework, which consists of asking patients about tobacco use, advising patients to quit smoking, assessing the patient's willingness to quit, assisting the patient to make a quit attempt, arranging for follow-up for the patient regarding tobacco cessation, and providing interventions, which include tobacco cessation counseling for those who identify as a tobacco user. The purpose of the retrospective chart review is to determine if primary care providers in a rural clinic in central Arkansas are following recommendations by the United States Preventative Services Task Force to assist adult smokers in quitting and decrease smoking complications by providing tobacco cessation counseling compared to the national average. Using a retrospective approach, 100 random charts were reviewed to determine if tobacco cessation counseling was provided to adult smokers in a rural primary care clinic. The review included 100 charts with documented tobacco use, adults ages 18 and older with the ICD code of Z72.0. Tobacco cessation interventions can be performed in several ways, including in-person behavioral support and counseling, telephone counseling, and self-help materials. Results found that 64% of charts had tobacco cessation counseling documented compared to the national average of 32.5%. Although above the national average, the United States Preventative Services Task Force recommends all tobacco users be provided tobacco cessation counseling. Cessation counseling interventions when performed alone or in combination with pharmacotherapy have been shown to dramatically increase successful cessation rates. 65% of charts reviewed were female while 35% were male. Although reports from this clinic show women being more likely to use tobacco, Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death in the United States for both men and women of all ages. The chart review found that majority of patients were in the age range of 40 to 49 with 26 patients. The youngest patient in the chart review was 18 years of age while the oldest was 79 years of age. The lowest age range was 18 to 29 with only 13 patients. Results from this chart review assist clinicians in becoming aware of the cessation counseling deficit. Although this clinic remains above the national average of 32.5%, the data provides opportunity for improvement of tobacco cessation counseling by healthcare professionals as recommended by the United States Preventative Services Task Force for all tobacco users. These are my references. Thank you very much. My name is Kayla Broadway, and I'm a graduate student at Arkansas State University, presenting to you today an analysis of depression screening rates among adult patients within a rural healthcare setting comparative to the national average. With limited diagnosis of depression, as well as the increasing number of suicide attempts and successes, it is important that screening for depression be as common as screening for diabetes or heart disease. The CDC associates depression with changes in mood, as well as cognitive and physical symptoms over at least a two week period. Because of this, depression is thought to be linked to high societal cost and functional impairments more than with any other chronic disease. In 2017, 17.3 million adults were diagnosed with one major depressive episode and 64% of those episodes came with impairments. With depression being diagnosed in less than 5% of the American population in 2017, there is importance in understanding the screening tools, their availability, their effectiveness, their necessity, and the effects from the lack of diagnosis of depression.
the United States Preventive Services Task Force, and the American Family Physician Journal recommend screening in the general teenage and adult population to help develop diagnosis, treatment, and appropriate follow-up in the health and safety of all patients. The purpose of this project is to collect data from a rural health clinic in Pocahontas, Arkansas, to determine the depression screening rates conducted in one year versus the national average. The method used in this project was a retrospective part review from 2017 that included a diagnosis of screening for depression, as well as the corresponding depression screening procedure code. Results prove that 29% of patients seen in the rural clinic were screened for depression based upon the ICD-9 code and corresponding CPT code, with only 29% of those being males. Most of the patients screened were within the ages of 65 to 79 years of age. I believe this to be due to the application of screening for depression being included in Medicare wellness visits in their care plans. The impact of this project will help to provide future advancements in applying and performing screening uh, procedures in primary care. These screenings will be used to prevent adverse events, promote treatment, and bring awareness to mental health. As long as the national average is low for depression screening rates, it is important to determine an advanced plan for screening that helps bring awareness to mental health diagnoses such as depression. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amber Freeman, and I'm a family nurse practitioner student here at Arkansas State University. The title of my quality improvement project is Tracking Obesity Intervention Education in Primary Care. Obesity rates here in the United States have almost tripled in the last 50 years. According to the CDC, in 2018, over 40% of Americans were classified as obese, and 37% of Arkansans were obese. Now, eating excess calories can appear insidious at first, but without proper exercise, weight gain encroaches. Obesity contributes to multiple comorbid conditions such as depression, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and more. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services created the Healthy People 2020 Target Goals, one of which was to increase the number of dietary or education counseling services to obese adults. And family nurse practitioners have an excellent opportunity to help make a difference in battling the obesity epidemic. The purpose of this clinical improvement project is to compare the obesity intervention education rates of a clinic in Northeast Arkansas to the Healthy People 2020 target goal of 15.6%. <clears throat> this project was conducted utilizing a retrospective chart review in which 100 charts were randomly selected with clinical encounters between the dates of January 1st, 2020 and November 17th, 2020 at the clinic in question. Inclusion criteria for this project consisted of BMI over 30 and age over 18. The data collected included age, race, gender, BMI, and whether or not the patient had documentation of obesity intervention education. The results, 22% had some type of nutritional or exercise education documented um, within the chart, which surpasses the 2020 target goal by 6.4%. The average age of these patients were 46 and a half, and the average BMI was 36.6. Um, as you can see here, 31.8% were male and 62 percent were female. Now these findings are consistent with CDC findings um, who say that women are almost 10% more likely to be more obese than men and that the age group most likely to be afflicted with severe obesity lie between the ages of 40 and 59. However, a major limitation of this study um, is the fact that I have 100% Caucasian in my sample. Um, the CDC reported that Hispanics have a higher prevalence of obesity than any other group. 
Now, literature shows that providers have improved with their compliance and documentation of obesity. However, further emphasis needs to be placed on providing nutritional and exercise counseling for obesity. The clinic evaluated in this quality improvement project surpassed the healthy people target goal. So the provider here really did a great job of providing that counseling. I believe one of the reasons the clinic was able to adhere to this measure is the support of their electronic medical system. <clears throat> they use Athena, which has a built-in quality measure tool um, that helps prompt the provider to address quality measures, including the BMI, screening and obesity and intervention education. It may benefit other clinics in high-risk areas, such as the Delta, um, to consider using these quality measure trackers. I'd like to say thank you to Randy Davis, who is my clinical instructor and faculty advisor to this project, and I hope that you guys enjoyed this presentation. Hi, my name is Christine Gatewood. My clinical improvement project is titled Routine Screening of Hepatitis C in Adults. Hepatitis C is the most prevalent bloodborne infection in the United States and worldwide. 70 to 80% of patients are asymptomatic, being unaware of the infection. Up to 40% of patients that are diagnosed are unaware, unaware of how they could have contracted the disease. This means they did not participate in high-risk activities such as IV drug use or have multiple sex partners. Infection rates have tripled between 2011 and 2016 related to the current opioid crisis. Ages 20 through 29 had a large increase in prevalence between 2009 and 2017, according to the CDC. If screening practices are not updated, this would mean that these patients would only be screened if they became symptomatic. At this point, the disease has progressed, which will make treatment more difficult, leading to increased medical expenses. The purpose of this clinical improvement project is to determine the rate of screening at a clinic in Batesville, Arkansas to the National Health Institute rate of 17.3%. To collect data, a retrospective chart review is performed using charts from March 2nd, 2020 to November 18th, 2020. Charts reviewed were coded with a wellness ICD-10 code and patients were aged 18 to 79 that were seen in this clinic within the date range. Additionally, all hepatitis C labs were obtained during those dates and analyzed as to whether they were performed as a screening or for diagnostic testing. The report builder within the Athena EMR database was utilized to collect this data. The results of the data collection determined that 1,477 patients were seen during the time frame meeting the criteria of a wellness exam in the age range. Out of these patients, 361 had a hepatitis C screening performed. This calculates to a 24.4% compliance rate, which is better than the National Health Institute rate of 17.3%. A total of 472 hepatitis C specific labs were drawn during the same time frame and age range. 361 were for screening and 111 were coded as a diagnostic code. This equates to 76.5% of the actual tests performed were used as a screening tool. If you look at the chart on the right, the orange bar signifies the number of screenings performed and the blue bar is the number of wellness exams. You can see that the younger population received very few screenings. The previous recommendation was to screen patients born between 1945 to 1965. It seems these patients in this age range still have the highest number of screenings. However, these recommendations have been expanded because the age of prevalence has changed related to the current opioid crisis the nation is facing. While the screening rates are higher than the National Health Institute at the clinic in Batesville, Arkansas, the ages prior to 60 to 69, the compliance rate is well below 17.3% in all age ranges. The impact of hepatitis C on the patient, the community, and the nation can be greatly reduced by implementing the new screening recommendation in daily practice. This one-time screening will help detect and diagnose patients that are asymptomatic, which will greatly decrease the spread of the disease. 
Early detection will also decrease the consequences that hepatitis C can have on the body, such as cirrhosis or liver cancer. The cost of the initial screening will outweigh the long-term cost associated with undiagnosed hepatitis C. Thank you. Hi, I'm Christy Gilliland, and I would like to share with you my DMP project on the local impact of implementing multimodal anesthesia for the total knee replacement patient in the surgical setting and the changes that can be made that increase the chances of having a successful recovery from surgery with little to no opioid use. The opioid epidemic is growing daily in the United States. Many times people are first introduced to opioids after surgery. Opioids have always been the traditional go-to for rapid postoperative pain relief, but the side effects of opioid analgesia can harm patient satisfaction and early postoperative outcome measures. Where anesthesia can play a role in assisting is by using a comprehensive multimodal plan. This approach refers to the application of more than one medication, class of drugs, or delivery of drugs to achieve pain control with multiple mechanisms that have a synergistic effect in producing optimal pain control. For the purpose of this project, I'll be taking a closer look at the anesthetic approach using a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, uh, acetaminophen, and a gabapentinoid orally before surgery, along with local anesthetic injected into the affected nerves before surgery and comparing it to patients who are only receiving the nerve blocks without the oral medications given. The plan with pain control and care for surgery must be met with purpose and treatments. The first purpose is to reduce opioid requirements. This starts as soon as the patient checks in for surgery until the patient actually is discharged home. The second purpose is to decrease postoperative pain. This ensures that the patient's up, they're ambulating, and therefore increases their chances for success. The third purpose is to decrease adverse events related to narcotics, such as urinary retention, slowing of gastric motility, delirium, delay in ambulation, and an increased length of stay. If any of these adverse events take place, the patient's length of stay can be increased even longer. Today, total joint arthroplasties are performed in two different settings. The traditional setting for this type of surgery has been the hospital with length of stays ranging anywhere from 24 to 72 hours. Many of these surgeries are now being performed in the outpatient surgery center settings where patients are being discharged just hours after surgery. The advantage of this outpatient setting is the patients are able to leave and recover in the comfort of their own homes. The key is to control postoperative pain to create this ideal situation for the patient. Many stakeholders are involved in the project, including patients, orthopedic surgeons, the anesthesia team, pharmacy, and of course the nurses. Why do some total joint patients leave just hours after surgery and others stay for days? The answer is simple. These patients are having a better pain control outcome. How is this done with multimodal plans that target pain and focus on less narcotic use? This will allow for minimal side effects that would uh, need observation in the hospital setting. Multimodal anesthesia is using all of the tools in the toolbox to help achieve a balanced outcome. Balanced anesthesia is the most common management strategy used in anesthesia care today. It includes the administration of different drugs together to create a synergistic effect. Balanced anesthesia uses less of each drug than if the drug were used alone. Thereby, it increases the likelihood of desired effects and reduces the likelihood of side effects. The multimodal approach is not a new practice. However, it has recently been utilized more in the anesthesia field. The method and design used for this particular project was a general linear model. Two different multimodal plans were compared. The use of pre-medications, acetaminophen and NSAID, a gabapentin in addition to an adductor canal block and a subarachnoid block were compared to those patients who only received the adductor canal block and the subarachnoid block. Descriptive statistics were used to describe and analyze the mentioned data. The preoperative and postoperative pain scales were measured along with the length of stay measured in tenths of hours since all of these patients went home the same day. The results of the comparison showed a significant difference between the patients who received the three oral, oral medications in addition to the nerve blocks prior to surgery. These patients had a significant decrease in their pain scores after surgery and went home quicker than the ones who did not take the oral medications. With the positive and significant results in this project, 
the contribution and recommendation going forward is to adopt the plan used at the surgery center and recommend its use by orthopedic surgeons in the hospital setting to help decrease pain levels and hopefully discharge patients home much sooner. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Ruth Griffith. The title of my project is Osteoporosis Quality Improvement Project. The topic is Osteoporosis Screening in Women Age 65 and Older. The United States Preventative Services Task Force recommends osteoporosis screening with bone mass measurement for all women 65 years and older. This screening is done using an imaging test called a DEXA scan that measures bone density. The purpose of this project is to evaluate the utilization rate of osteoporosis screening at a local Northeast Arkansas clinic in women age 65 and over as recommended by the United States Preventative Services Task Force. This would identify a potential deficit in the screening practices, in the osteoporosis screening practices at this clinic. If a deficit is, is identified, this allows for an improvement in this screening process and in the patient care. This screening is usually repeated every two years to 10 years, depending on the findings and severity of disease on the first screening. As we age, our bones become thinner and weaker. Osteoporosis is diagnosed when a person's bone density has decreased significantly. This places these patients at an increased risk of fractures. Osteoporosis is more common in women and affects about 25% of women age 65 and over. It is a silent disease, meaning there are often no symptoms prior to the first fracture. Osteoporosis is also associated with a high morbidity and mortality rate. One study revealed that within 12 months after experiencing an osteoporotic fracture, about 15% of these patients suffered one or more subsequent fractures and nearly 20% died. Mortality was highest in those with a hip fracture with 30% dying within 12 months. This data shows how important screening for osteoporosis is. The method used for data collection in this project was a re retrospective review of 500 randomly chosen charts of patients seen in 2019. The data was collected by the facility per their policy after providing them with inclusion data. The inclusion data was women aged 65 or older that were seen in 2019. The data obtained included the patient's age and if they had a bone density scan in 2019. The result, results showed that 4.8% of women 65 and older seen at this local clinic had a bone density scan in 2019. With the recommendations of osteoporosis screening starting at age 65, you could in theory expect an age uh, expect the age groups of 65 and 66 year olds to have a much higher screening rate than the other ages. So I broke down the data in more detail and it's listed here. Out of 500 charts, 32 were 65 years old. Only two of those patients had a DEXA scan that year, which is 6.25% of those patients being screened. 20 of the patients were 66 years old and only one of those patients had a DEXA scan in 2019. This is 5% of those patients. 65 to 69 year olds was an 8.3% of the patients having a DEXA scan. 70 to 74 year old, 5.6% of this age group had been screened and 75 and older only 2.5 had been screened, 2.5%. The data revealed probable underutilization of osteoporosis screening with bone density scans. There are many treatment options for osteoporosis that can reduce fracture risk. As mentioned before, fractures can have a devastating effect in this um, population. It is important to identify osteoporosis prior to the patient experiencing a fracture. The results of this project can be useful to the clinic by identifying a potential deficit in care that can be closely reviewed and improved. Identifying a deficit allows improvement of the osteoporosis screening rates at this clinic, ultimately improving the health of this patient population. Lastly, the results of this project have been useful as I transition from a student to a nurse practitioner, providing care for this population. I now have an improved knowledge about osteoporosis and the importance of screening 
that will be beneficial as a nurse practitioner and improve my osteoporosis screening practices in the patients I provide care for. Evaluation of adherence to low-dose computed tomography recommendations for lung cancer screening in a rural family practice clinic by Courtney Harris. Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer mortality worldwide and is often diagnosed at an advanced stage when treatment options are limited. Annually, lung cancer leads to more deaths than prostate cancer, colon cancer, and breast cancer combined. Routine screening for lung cancer with low-dose computed tomography reduces lung cancer mortality by up to 20%. The five-year survival rates increase substantially with early diagnosis. The United States Preventive Service Task Force released guidelines for lung cancer screening in 2013 to reduce lung cancer mortality rates. In 2015, over 7.5 million people were eligible for screening per guidelines, and only 1.9% of those received low-dose CTs. Some studies show that less than half of primary care providers are aware of current guidelines for lung cancer screening. Provider awareness and patient education are essential to improving screening rates and decreasing lung cancer mortality. The purpose of this project was to discover performance rate of low-dose CT screenings in a local rural family practice clinic in Northeast Arkansas and compare it to the national average. Goals of this project are to increase awareness of lung cancer screening guidelines and promote utilization of low-dose CT screenings. The data collection for this project was performed using a retrospective chart review on patients seen from January 1st to April 1st, 2020, in a rural family practice clinic. Inclusion criteria were patients aged 55 to 80 years, current or former smokers with a smoking history of at least 30 pack years. If they were former smokers, their quit date needed to be in the last 15 years. Limitations included a lack of smoking history documented resulting in exclusion from data analysis, a small time frame examined, and a small sample size analyzed. The no total number of charts reviewed were 117. There were 43 charts that had the data required for analysis. There were 19 patients eligible for the low dose CT screening. Only one of those received the low dose CT. That gave us a performance rate of 5.26%. The national average is only 1.9%. The facility performed above the national average in comparison. While the rate of 5.26% is above the national average, it is still extremely low. Screenings for any disease are only beneficial when performed. The results from this project were limited due to a lack of documentation and smoking history which resulted in 74 charts being excluded from data analysis. Out of the 117 charts reviewed, there were six low-dose CTs performed. If we assume that all six patients were qualified for a low-dose CT per guidelines, the performance rate would be 5.13%, remaining in the 5% range. The data from this project can be utilized by both providers and the facility in several ways. It increases awareness of current guideline recommendations for lung cancer screening. The data evaluates provider adherence to guidelines allowing the facility and providers to assess performance meeting guideline recommendations. It identifies education needs of providers, staff, and patients regarding lung cancer screening recommendations and it can inspire ingenuity in healthcare to discover systems to increase routine screening. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kimberly Harris, and the title of my quality improvement project is Initiation of Metformin in Prediabetes Patients. Approximately 11% of Americans are living with diabetes. In many cases, there is warning before destruction. 
Tennessee.gov reports that one in three Americans have prediabetes. If you have prediabetes, your blood glucose levels are elevated but not high enough to yield a diagnosis of diabetes. This elevation is due to the pancreas not allowing the body to utilize its insulin well or due to a lessening of the ins body's insulin production. Prediabetes classification per American Diabetes Association guidelines are a fasting plasma glucose of 100 to 125 milligrams per deciliter, a hemoglobin A1C of 5.7 to 6.4%, or an oral glucose tolerance test of 140 to 199 milligrams per deciliter. Despite the number of people living with diabetes and the American Diabetes Association recommendation, the initiation of metformin in prediabetic patients is underutilized. Diabetes is a condition that is driven by obesity. Therefore, a BMI greater than 24.99 predisposes an individual to diabetes and other comorbidities. The development of diabetes and comorbidities can be decelerated or reversed with the early initiation of metformin in addition to lifestyle modifications. Metformin is a safe, cost-effective medication that works to lower blood glucose released within the liver without resulting in hypoglycemic states. The purpose of this quality improvement project is to identify the percentage of individuals in a small family practice clinic in Memphis, Tennessee that were between the ages of 18 to 44 with prediabetes and prescribed metformin as a recommended by ADA. A randomized sample search with pre-recorded medical records between January the 1st, 2020 through November 18, 2020 was composed to perform retrospective chart reviews that audited 30 patients' charts with prediabetes. The charts were further analyzed to assess if metformin was initiated. The data was analyzed by age, gender, and diagnostic codes, abnormal blood glucose, and prediabetes, and if patients were prescribed metformin. Prediabetes was um, reviewed by age ranging from 18 to 44 with the highest range of individuals in their 40s. With gender, 67% were females and 33% were males. As for race, 73% were Blacks, 23% were white, 4% were Hispanic, and the other, there were no other races identified within the 30 chart success. The, the ICD-10 code that is commonly used is the um, abnormal blood glucose, that's R7309. The results reveal that there is a small, in the small clinic in Memphis, Tennessee, that there is 27% adherence to the ADA recommendation of initiation of metformin in prediabetic patients. Therefore, it is an increased requisite for intervention to take place. The quality improvement project is useful in determining to what extent are providers following the recommendations by our ADA guidelines by treating all patients with prediabetes and metformin. This quality improvement project also aims to improve provider compliance with ADA guidelines to promote optimum outcomes in prediabetic patients by delaying or reversing the development of diabetes. Let's be the change in health and wellness. This concludes my quality improvement project on initiation of metformin in prediabetes patients. Hello, my name is James Hawley. I'm a nurse practitioner from a very rural area in Southwest Mississippi. I'm dual board certified in emergency and family practice. My project is titled Developing end-of-life discussion protocols in rural primary care clinics. I would like to begin by giving you a little background into why I chose this topic. As an NP working in both primary and emergency settings, I noticed a gap in advanced care directives and overall end-of-life issues being managed in the primary care arena. 
Far too often, elderly patients with end-stage comorbidities present to the emergency department with no advanced directives in place. The great Benjamin Franklin is attributed to having said two things are certain, death and taxes. Death is a part of life that everyone must face at some point. The focus on healthcare is centered on prolonging life and preventing disease. Very little attention is given to end of life issues. Advanced care planning has historically been a taboo subject to patients and providers alike because it's an uncomfortable topic to initiate. Advanced care planning is an integral and widely overlooked component of healthcare, and it is a disservice to patients and caretakers to readily offer advice on how to live, but neglect to give anticipatory guidance on how one should choose to die. Much of the population has a distorted understanding of the long-term outcomes of life-supporting interventions such as intubation and chest compressions. While these measures can prolong the length of life, they have a detrimental impact on the physical and emotional quality of life that the patient has left. In the absence of a clearly documented advanced directive, emergency providers are required to initiate resuscitative efforts, even when there may, this may not have been the choice of the individual if they had been given the option. Uh, for the setting, I, I use Field Health System, which is a critical access hospital system that comprises five primary care rural health clinics. This project was conducted utilizing records from Liberty, Gloucester, Centerville, Field, and Catchings Clinic. The qual this qualitative study consisted of a retrospective, retrospective chart review, both pre and post implementation of end of life discussion protocol. Providers were surveyed to determine barriers to end of life discussions and a tailored educational program using evidence derived from the literature was administered to the primary care providers. Charts were reviewed prior to implementation of the survey to identify the percentage of 65 year of age or older Medicare patients with documented EOL discussions prior to and after the intervention. Data collected included age, gender, primary location, and whether EOL discussions had been performed and documented appropriately. Data was collected from the EMR utilized by the practice via EMR reports and chart reviews. Then data reports were ran by the principal investigator. Data from all annual wellness visit charts were reviewed to analyze whether the end of life discussion was performed and documented, and then reanalyzed after, impl after implementation of focused provider education to determine if there was any increase in the number of appropriately documented discussions. A convenient sample of patient records who met inclusion criteria seen at the participating clinic locations were utilized for this project. After surveying all PCPs in the five primary clinics, the number one barrier to initiating end-of-life discussion was determined to be lack of preparation. Providers overwhelmingly cited a lack of knowledge of legal and technical aspects of advanced directives as the biggest obstacle. Utilizing Carl Rogers' experiential learning theory, I implemented the individual in-service sessions with each provider focus on communication skills and the legal aspects to assisting patients with advanced directives and documenting them in the chart. As you can see, all five clinics showed an increase in the number of documented end-of-life discussions after the educational sessions. Given obstacles related to the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic, this project has not yet been completed at this time and more results are pending. I fully anticipate to see a continued increase in documented end of life discussions with data analysis completed in the coming weeks. This has been both a challenging and rewarding project throughout the course of the project. I've had a great deal of interaction with the chronic care management nursing team overseeing implementation during the annual wellness visits. Staff and provider education and guidance has been a crucial component in imp improving this aspect of patient centered care. This project has allowed me to highlight the trio of roles for the DMP, administration, education, and practice. Thank you for your time and attention. Hello, my name is Melissa Hayes and my Create A State Quality Improvement Project is titled A Family Clinic's Lung Cancer Screening Rate Versus National Average of 5.9%. So lung cancer is the number one cause of cancer death in America. 
screening appropriately has been shown to decrease mortality rate by 20%. Only about 5.9% of the patients who meet screening criteria set forth by the United States Preventative Services Task Force are being screened appropriately by their providers. The purpose of this quality improvement project was to compare the lung cancer screening rates of the national average to the rural uh, Arkansas Clinic in hopes of saving patient lives. So following the national guidelines for screening is proven to save lives and to catch cancer, cancer in the most early stages. So a qualitative approach was used as my methodology. I used retrospective, retrospective chart reviews to look through 100 charts at this Arkansas clinic. I used ICD-10 codes of Z87.891, um, which is former smoker, and F17.210, which is current smoker. And they had to be between the ages of 55 and 80 as in the guidelines. So I documented my findings. And the results show that 39% of the patients at this clinic were screened appropriately and had the, Ill, the low dose CT scan ordered as recommended. 18% of the patients, they were screened appropriately, but they refused the low dose CT scan. Most of them refused it because they didn't have insurance, according to the documentation. 20% of the patients did not meet criteria. Most of them were because they did not have the 30-year pack smoking history that's required for the screening. So that leaves us with 23 patients that were not screened appropriately. They weren't screened at all, actually, per documentation. So what's the impact of the results? So if you have 23 patients or 23% that were not screened at all and should have been, if you look at the national average, it's one out of 16 adults, men and women, will be diagnosed with lung cancer in their life. So that's about one and a half patients at this clinic out of 100 charts that should have been screened and will probably end up with lung cancer and it won't be caught till later in life. Now the the big thing about that is lung cancer only has a five-year survival rate once it's diagnosed. So I mean they're looking at five years and probably a poor quality of life. Some other things that the results showed was that when you offer these screenings and educate the patients about these screenings, it creates better rapport between the provider and the patient. They trust you more. And then there's always the reimbursement part of it. Um, the reimbursement per, per low dose CT scan on average is about $241. It certainly doesn't cost that much for us as providers to order that test and for the test to be done. So that's an additional $9,640 in compensation just on the 23 patients that were missed out on. Most insurances cover these screenings at no cost to the patient. And that's important to know when you're recommending this screening to the patient. And then if you meet the Medicare and Medicaid guidelines for screening, they pay out bonuses yearly if you meet those guidelines at a certain percentage. So that's even more money on top of the compensation for reimbursement of the procedure. Um, so just more education provided to the patients, um, maybe the 20 or the 18 percent that did not wish to have the low dose CAT scan, if they would have just had that education, maybe more persuasiveness to let them know how important it is, maybe they would have went ahead and, and gotten it. And that's the end. I hope you all have a great day and thank you for listening.
My name is Sarah Highfill, and I am a student in the Master of Science in Nursing program in the Family Nurse Practitioner Track. My quality improvement project considers the current clinical guidelines for cervical cancer screening in women aged 21 to 65, as published by the United States Preventive Services Task Force in 2018. Since the introduction of effective cervical cancer screening in the mid 20th century, specifically what is commonly referred to as the pap test or the pap smear, and the more recent addition of HPV or human papilloma virus testing, the global incidence rate of cervical cancer has decreased by more than 50% over the past 50 years. However, even with this significant decline, cervical cancer is still the fourth most common cancer among women worldwide and the second most common cancer among women living in less developed regions of the world. In the United States, the incidence rate is currently about 7.4 to 7.6 per 100,000 women. However, the death rate from cervical cancer has dropped drastically in this country from over 35 per 100,000 women back in 1930 to about 2.3 per 100,000 women today. The most recent statistics for the state of Arkansas show the incidence of cervical cancer as 9.8 per 100,000 women, and the death rate is 3.5 per 100,000 women, which you can see is slightly higher than the national average here on this slide. By following updated evidence-based guidelines, healthcare providers can reduce unnecessary screening and follow-up testing for women while optimizing the chance to diagnose cervical cancer early in the disease process in a cost-effective way. The purpose of this quality improvement project was to compare the rate of cervical cancer screening for female patients aged 21 to 65 at a community clinic in Northwest Arkansas to the rate of the national rate of 85%. My hypothesis was that the rate would meet or exceed the national average, largely due in part to the affluence of Benton County, where this clinic is located, and the fact that Benton County had the lowest incidence rate of cervical cancer among the groups that I had studied. A retrospective chart review of female patients who visited the clinic between the dates of January 1st, 2019 and December 31st, 2019 was conducted, and data collection included gender, age, and whether they received a PAP HPV test. This rate was then compared to the national average to determine to what extent the providers were following current United States Preventative Services Task Force guidelines for cervical cancer screening. Exclusion criteria included biological men, women outside of the age range, and women who had previously had qualifying hysterectomies. During the year 2019, 449 women received a general adult medical examination or a gynecological examination at this clinic. In that group, 76 women within the guidelines, um, the age range for those in the guidelines age range had qualifying hysterectomies and did not qualify for PAP HPV testing. Of the 373 women who should have received testing, the best data I could find showed that 362 did receive the appropriate testing at the appropriate interval, which results in a rate of 97% accuracy for cervical cancer screening at this clinic. And this far exceeds the national average of 85%. When I originally began this project, I wanted to focus specifically on HPV testing because what I had seen in the past decade of nursing practice made me really question whether or not providers were actually following the clinical guidelines that really individualize a patient's care for a number of reasons. But I expanded that to include the totality of cervical cancer screening because of how widespread this cancer is and the fact that it's largely preventable given the right resources, especially with the advent of the HPV vaccine, which I speak to in my paper. Research shows that women who receive inappropriate testing at the inappropriate interval undergo far more unnecessary testing and follow-up procedures, which put her at risk for more complications with her reproductive system in the future. This is also a major source of medical waste, inappropriate use of clinician time, and a misuse of financial resources for the patient, the clinic, and the third-party insurer. In other words, under-testing results in cervical cancer deaths, while over-testing results in a waste of resources and physical complications for patients in the future. 
In addition, there are currently some European studies that are showing that even our 2018 guidelines may already be outdated. So we should look for those recommend recommendations to change here in the near future. And although this clinic is performing very well in cervical cancer screening, my hope is that this is a helpful tool for them to use to look at gaps in care so they may be able to capture 100% women who need cervical cancer screening so that ultimately those patient outcomes are improved. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kaylee Holland and I will be talking about my project, the prevalence of polypharmacy in the adult population. So what is polypharmacy? Polypharmacy is broadly defined as the use of five or more medications concurrently, and this does include over-the-counter medications. It's primarily seen in the geriatric population, those aged 65 years and older, but we are seeing an increase in the younger adult population um, as far as like 40 years and older. We're seeing that increase in polypharmacy. So why does this matter? This matters because polypharmacy has been correlated with worse patient outcomes and adverse drug events. Um, inappropriate polypharmacy specifically um, compared to appropriate polypharmacy is the inattentive management of a patient's medication list. Um, and this specifically is what leads to those unwarranted medications, potential adverse reactions, and then drug-to-drug -drug reactions. The purpose of this project is um, to compare the local prevalence of polypharmacy um, in, the, in patients aged 40 to 79 years to the national prevalence, which is 22.4%. The methods of this study, the location um, where the data was collected was at a family practice clinic in Jonesboro, Arkansas. And then a retrospective chart review with exploratory design was utilized to collect the data. 45 charts total were reviewed, um, including patients who visited the clinic from January 1st to November 4th of 2020. So the inclusion criteria consisted of the patient could be male or female. The um, age had to be at least 40 years or older, and they had to have been an established patient within that given time frame. The exclusion criteria, the patients, any patients less than 40, any patients who were not established at that clinic, and any patients who had not been seen, um, who had been seen outside of that given time frame. So um, our data interpreted, a total of 2,880 patient visits were recorded between the dates of January 1st to November 4th, 2020. And this amounted to um, about 1,152 actual patients seen within that 10 month time frame because there were patients that had multiple visits. 742 patients met our inclusion criteria to be included in the study, and 326 patients who met the criteria were taking five or more medications. 45 patients who met the criteria were taking 10 or more medications, so we kind of focused in on this patient group right here. Population characteristics, the average age um, was 62 years with a minimum age of 42 and a maximum age of 88 years. The primary gender was female with 27 females and 18 males. The primary race was Caucasian with 31 Caucasian and 14 African-American. And then the primary associated diagnoses that we found correlated with polypharmacy the most were diabetes and hypertension with 60% of the patients having a diagnosis of diabetes, hypertension, or both. So the results of our data, 64.4% um, of the population met the criteria to be included in this project. Um, polypharmacy, which is the use of five or more medications, was identified in 43.9% of the patients, and 6% were taking 10 or more medications. So while there are limitations to this study, um, the goal was to identify the prevalence of polypharmacy at this clinic in Jonesboro and compare it to the national average. Um, so our percentage was 43.9 and the national average was 22.4. So Jonesboro did, this clinic did rank higher than the national average. Um, evidence suggests that the presence of polypharmacy is correlated with worst, worst patient outcomes. Um, <clears throat> so the results of this project indicate a higher prevalence um, in this area than nationally. Now that national project was a couple of years old, so there is some room for discussion there. Um, but the primary goal of this was to educate providers and future providers 
um, by presenting the data so that we could be more proactive in the management of uh, medication lists and just be more aware of polypharmacy in general. Thank you. My name is Mary Lee Keenum. This is my FMP project. The title is Screening for Hypertension in a Rural Health Clinic in Northeast Arkansas. So undetected high blood pressure can lead to cardiovascular disease, stroke, heart attack, and kidney disease. And hypertension affects almost 45% of the United States population. And you can see on this map here that the South where we live at is very heavily affected. Screening for high blood pressure could help prevent complications that are related to hypertension. We should also be providing patient education to promote awareness and the importance of a normal, a normal blood pressure. Um, goals would be to reduce morbidity and mortality that's related to hypertension and these complications. This would also help reduce the financial burden caused by hypertension and its complications. The purpose of this project is to evaluate the percentage of blood pressure screenings that are conducted in a primary care clinic. The United States Protective Task Force recommends that all adults ages 18 to 75 be screened for high blood pressure. American Heart Association provides education for, provider, for providers and patients about the proper technique. And this is so important to check for um, high blood pressure because it's considered to be a silent killer. And the reason for that is because many people who have high blood pressure don't know it. The data was collected from a ret retrospective chart review and I used 75 charts with the ICD-10 code for blood pressure screening. I excluded patients that were younger than 18 and older than 75 and those that already had a diagnosis of hypertension. The results of the data that was analyzed showed that 89% uh, of the patients were screened for high blood pressure. The recommendation is 100%, and the limitation of this project is a small sample size. So these results will be given to the clinic to help them identify any areas that they may need to work on, like in their protocols or processes or in their workflow. Um, the goals would be to improve the patient awareness about blood pressure screening and the devastating effects of hypertension. Doing this could help decrease the incidence of complications related to high blood pressure. The uh, striving to meet the goal of 100% screening should be an ongoing process to ensure evidence-based practice. Vulnerable populations in the community should be a focus and could be targeted with pressure, pressure screenings at health fairs, grocery stores, or community centers. So the additional resources that uh, would be needed for education, supplies, and personnel could be attained through stakeholders like grocery stores or other businesses in the community, local and state government, and grants. And finally, nurse practitioners and health providers are the key component to a healthier patient and community. Hi, my name is Garrett Crossell. I'm an FMP graduate student. My quality improvement project is a local clinic's compliance with new hepatitis C screening versus the national average. What is hepatitis C or hep C? It is a blood-borne illness, illness that can lead to cirrhosis of the liver, liver cancer, and even death. The major risk factors include multiple sex partners and IV drug abuse. Prevalence. According to data collected in 2018, the highest prevalence of hep C are among those ages 20 to 29 at 3.1 per 100,000 individuals. In Sling County, in the clinic that I did the research, 
nine out of 100,000 individuals are representative in that age group. 40% of individuals are unaware that they are hep C positive. Incident. The incidence in Arkansas is 0 0.3 per 100,000 individuals compared to the national 1.2 per 100,000 individuals. Saline County has six out of 100,000 individuals uh, among those aged 20 to 29. Screening recommendations. A large incidence of incident of hep C among young adults is why screening recommendations were updated on March 2nd, 2020. The screening recommendations now include individuals age 18 to 79 be screened once or periodically for those at high risk. Before, it only included individuals born between 1945 and 1965. The purpose of this project is to determine a local clinic screening rate and compare it to the national average. Methodology. This project was a retrospective chart review of 50 patients' charts, looking to see if new or annual office visit patients ages 18 to 79 were being screened for hepatitis C based off of recommended guidelines. Breakdown of results. The average age of the patients' charts reviewed was 41 years old. The majority of patients were Caucasian females presenting for an annual office visit. The results. The results of this project showed three out of 50 patients were screened for hepatitis C. This is a 6% screening rate. That is 12% less than the national screening rate of 18%. Although three out of 50 patients were screened. They were not screened based on recommendations, but were screened based off of chief complaint. The main chief complaint was exposure to STDs. Six and 18% screening rates are not impressive and should concern healthcare providers. Project limitations. The major limitation on this project is the limited available screening data. Although hepatitis C is, a, is reportable data, screening is not. The national average or rate conveyed was data from an old screening, was data from the old screening recommendation. The other major limitation was the decreased patient availability. The screening recommendation was released at the beginning of a global pandemic. A majority of the clinic's visits were transitioned to telehealth for most of spring and summer 2020. Implications for nursing. As mentioned before, having a small screening rate for recommended screening should alert and concern healthcare providers. It shows an area of improvement. Having a large incident of hepatitis C in Arkansas and low screening rates proves that hepatitis C is a major concern and healthcare need. Hopefully this will educate healthcare providers on the importance of following recommendations and will lead to a decrease in hepatitis C incidents and its related disease processes. These are my references. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, and thank you for taking the time to listen to my presentation. I wanted to tell you a little bit about my project. My project focused on a local clinic statin therapy prescription rate compared to the national average. The first thing that I want to talk to you about is cardiovascular disease and how important it is to prevent cardiovascular disease um, through things like statin therapy initiation. Um, cardiovascular disease is currently the leading cause of morbidity and mortality in the United States, and we need to focus on some modifiable risk factors to help um, prevent adverse events such as stroke or myocardial infarction. Currently in the United States, about 46% of our population has hypertension, and it's predicted that by 2035, we will have about 45.1% of our population with cardiovascular disease. So it's very important that we prevent this as much as we can. 
the impact of cardiovascular disease and adverse events on our healthcare system is pretty significant. The, in the US, it costs about $219 billion each year to um, spend things on associated adverse events such as stroke management in the beginning um, of diagnosis and as well as rehabilitation and therapy, trying to get the patient back to their previous level of functioning. About 1.6 of every US, uh, one in every six US dollars is spent on cardiovascular disease and its management. One of the ways that we can prevent adverse events is through statin therapy initiation. The US Preventative Task Force um, released some guidelines and criteria on initiating statin therapy. Statins um, assist with lowering the lipid levels in the body and assisting to prevent things like um, blocked arteries leading to, you know, blocked carotids that cause stroke. Um, the LDL level needed to be greater than 190. The patients needing to need to be between um, 40 to 75 years of age and either have a calculated 10-year risk assessment um, percentage greater than five or 20%, and they um, could also just have diabetes and qualify for statin therapy. Um, the 10-year risk percentage is um, kind of how at risk the patient is for adverse events to occur. It's like how at risk are they to have a heart attack or a stroke or something like that. The design method that I used to collect data was a retros retrospective chart review of about 50 patient charts. Um, I included those aged 40 to 75 years, and they needed to have at least one risk factor associated with cardiovascular disease, either family history, smoking, um, they're diabetic, or they have hypertension, or they've had a prior myocardial infarction. Um, I also looked at age, gender, race, and if they were on a lipid therapy or what type of lipid lowering therapy they were on. In order to calculate their cardiovascular risk and their percentage, um, how likely they are to develop an adverse event or suffer from one, I needed to first identify the risk factors. Are they hypertensive? Do they have diabetes? Do they smoke? Um, then we need to look at their lipid levels. Is their LDL above 190 or um, is their calculated 10 year risk percentage over five or 20%? Um, then you need to individualize their therapy. So are there reasons why they're not on a statin therapy? Um, are they allergic? Are they intolerant? Things like that. The statin therapy adherence rate for the national guidelines um, that are currently recommended in the United States is 18 to 26%. So it's improving over the years. That's between 2003 and 2012. That's our latest data. Um, the local clinic that I looked at, their adherence rate was actually 84%. I had a small sample size of 50 charts, but that's that's pretty good for a very, very tiny clinic. Um, the only patients that were not initiated on a statin therapy when it was indicated were about eight out of the 50 charts that I reviewed. And the patients were either allergic, intolerant, or they wanted to seek out um, lifestyle management um, prior to initiating statin therapy. So some reasons that patients might not um, be initiated on statin therapy is their, their lack insurance coverage. So statin therapy increased when the patients had more insurance coverage and it also increased as patients aged. Some ways that we can prevent cardiovascular disease overall is we need to do early identification through some screenings. So every time the patients come in for those fasting labs, every three to six months, we can catch this and we can decide whether they need to be initiated on a statin therapy just by looking at their LDL and HDL levels um, or their total cholesterol in general. Um, it's so important to do these preventative therapies and not only the medical therapies such as statin, we also need to work on the other modifiable risk factors because their cardiovascular risk percentage significantly decreased, for instance, when they just stopped smoking. So we also need to continue with education and working on the other modifiable risk factors in addition to medical therapy. And thank you guys so much for listening to my presentation. I look forward to answering any questions that you guys may have.
Hello, my name is Caitlin Mason. I'm an FNP student. I completed a quality improvement project titled The Rate of Harper Zoster Vaccination in a Clinic in Arkansas Compared to the National Average. The purpose of this quality improvement project was to examine the rates of completion of the Shingrex vaccine series in adults 50 years of age or older at a primary care clinic in Marion, Arkansas, compared to the national average of 34.9%. This topic is important because approximately 95 of all 95% of all adults in the Western world will develop herpes zoster infections at some point in their lives. Conversely, the current rate of vaccination against herpes zoster in the United States is only 34.9%. That's a big gap between the amount of people that are affected by herpes zoster and the amount of people who are vaccinated against developing, developing it. Uh, there are currently two vaccines available for herpes zoster vaccination in the United States. The older vaccine, Zostavax, has been around for many years. The newer vaccine, Shingrex, has been around since 2017 and is currently the recommended vaccine of choice for herpes zoster um, by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the United States. As a part of my methodology, I utilized a descriptive design with a randomized convenience sample. As a part of my inclusion criteria, I included any adult um, aged 50 or older, and they could be male or female, and they were seen in the clinic in Marion, Arkansas from January 13, 2021 to February 10, 2021. When I was collecting my data, I used a retrospective chart review system um, I looked at the, I utilized the EMR at the clinic that I was doing my clinicals at and reviewed 35 charts. Um, once I gathered all my data, I entered it into Excel and used this to, pre to perform my statistical analysis. After my analysis was ran, I found that a total of eight of the 35 charts that I reviewed had patients that were vaccinated against herpes zoster with a Shingrex vaccine that comes out to about 22% of my sample size, which is slightly lower than the national average of 34.9%. Uh, as a part of my analysis, I broke down my groups into their ages. I had 14 participants who were 50 to 60 years old, 10 participants were 61 to 70, seven participants that are 71 to 80, and one participant who was greater than 80 years old. Um, I further broke it down into males and females and whether they were vaccinated or not. There were a total of 19 females charts that were reviewed, and of this 19, there were only six that were vaccinated. Um, there were a total of 16 males charts that were reviewed, and out of the 16, there were only two males who were vaccinated. So in my study, um, I did have a much lower vaccine rate with males rather than females. This study is important because it um, brings to light how we're lacking in our herpes zoster vaccinations in our local area. Um, we have the potential to, with gathering this information to provide information to providers um, so that they are able to increase their herpes zoster vaccination rates in their clinics, which can in turn reduce the complications that patients are having from herpes zoster infections. Um, primary care providers are the ones that see their patients most often. They're the ones that have the opportunity to provide the education to their patients on the Shingrex vaccine and why it's important to um, get the Shingrex vaccine against herpes zoster. And so this is what my study is contributing to um, herpes zoster infection prevention. Um, it's my list of references. Thank you so much. Again, my name is Caitlin Mason, FMP student. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Sheila McCarley. I'm a graduate student presently enrolled at Arkansas State University. Today, I will be presenting to you my project titled Student Registered Nurse Anesthetist Perspective on the Impact of a Clinical Mentoring Program. My project chair was Dr. Cassandra Massey. In spite of a reported 57,000 practicing nurse anesthesia providers, including students, there is still a nationwide nursing shortage. Staffing turnover rates are at 35 to 65% in the nursing profession alone. Reasons for this turnover rate include retiring staff, decreased ability to retain student uh, nurse anesthesia graduates, as well as poor work environment. The role of a mentor in the student clinical uh, setting provides positive correlations with improving the student nurse anesthetist uh, transition period into the clinical setting. It also provides support as well as instructions for clinical development. The problem statement in the student registered nurse anesthetist clinical learning environment, is it perceived that a student clinical mentoring program will positively impact the student's skill development, role satisfaction, as well as retention? The main objective of this project is to evaluate the implementation of a clinical mentoring program and the uh, potential impact that it may have on the student's development and training. The theoretical framework used for this project was the Banner Novice to Expert model. The literature supports mentoring as a positive impact on role satisfaction, skill development, and also retention. And a study completed by Ab Abdullah et al. This was a systemic uh, review focused, that focused on mentoring as a knowledge translation tool to support the uptake of evidence into the clinical practice. A study completed by Schreier, Zellers, and Abraham was a study that was completed to, that calculated retention rates among RNs after the implementation of a mentoring program in the facility. There was a 91% um, rate of increase of retention after mentoring the nurses. A study completed by Kim et al. was a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring study that evaluated the impact of mentoring on anxiety, self-efficacy, academic performance, and satisfaction choices of their um, choices with choosing nursing as a career. This study did show that mentoring post the completion found that it did reduce anxiety, it fostered academic success, as well as enhanced the professional satisfaction among beginning nursing students. This study was completed as a qualitative method of data collection. This study was reviewed and approved by the Arkansas State Review Board. The questionnaire was reviewed and developed and approved by project chair prior to distributing it to students at the Arkansas State. There was a total of 30 students that were recruited and asked to complete the survey. 19 surveys were completed and returned and used for data analysis. Consent was understood by the completion of the questionnaire after returning via email. The results of this study showed that mentoring characteristics had a 98% um, results that stated that they felt that mentoring characteristics would impact their role satisfaction. The impact on the skill development reported was 99%. 98.5 of the participants reported that they felt the mentoring characteristics would impact their clinical setting retention. Whereas 68% of the participants felt that the clinical mentoring program would impact their decision to stay at the site that has the clinical mentoring program. On-site CRNA um, student clinical mentoring would decrease the time and costs needed for uh, postgraduate orientation, therefore decreasing re uh, recruitment costs. Graduating classes provide new candidates each year for employment. Mentoring plays a key role in reducing the economic burden associated with recruitment costs. The impact of mentorship and nursing creates a great reputation for the nursing profession. So the student nurse anesthetist mentorship program implemented into practice at this facility would benefit the transitioning of the students into the clinical setting. Decreased recruiting costs, 
as well as implementation may provide an atmosphere that encourages confidence and communication that leads to patient safety. Thank you. My name is Karis McDaniel and I'm a second year graduate student in the Occupational Therapy Doctorate Program. I'm interested in the limb different population and I'm excited to share my study with you today. My faculty mentor is Dr. Amanda Carpenter, who is also the student research director in the OTD program. The title of my presentation is An Evidence-Based Approach to Developing Occupational Therapy Interventions Aimed at Improving Mental Health Outcomes Among the Limb Different Population. To begin, the term limb different describes 2 million individuals within the United States who are living with the absence of one or more of their arms and legs due to a birth defect or amputation. Unfortunately, many within this population are at high risk for developing body image issues, anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts related to their limb difference. Occupational therapy has transitioned from an experience-based profession to an evidence-based profession within the past 30 years. It is a research emergent profession, which means that there are opportunities to develop innovative treatment interventions and strategies in developing areas that fall within our role and scope. The research question driving our current study is, what does the existing literature suggest for improving mental health outcomes among the limb different population? Specifically, what is occupational therapy's unique contribution to improving mental health outcomes among the limb different population? To answer our research question, we framed our study using the current edition of the occupational therapy practice framework. The overall mission of occupational therapy is to achieve health, well being, and participation in life through engagement and occupation. To achieve this, we did our process of evaluation, intervention, and outcomes. We were also focused on the following domains, occupations, context, performance patterns, performance skills, and client factors. We employed a scoping review methodology to explore our research question. Scoping reviews synthesize and assess the scope of literature on a topic. We followed the preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analyses guidelines. First, we specified inclusion criteria, which were limb different studies pertaining to mental health, including depression, anxiety, and body image, published since 2000 and written in English. Next, we developed keyword syntax and included limb different terminology, such as amputee and limb loss, as well as occupational therapy terminology, including intervention and activities of daily living. Finally, we conducted the searches using CINAHL and PubMed databases. The Prisma flow diagram provides details about our process. We initially identified 2,444 articles, then removed 215 duplicates. We screened 2,229 articles and excluded 2,205 articles. The final number of studies included in the review was 24. After reviewing the 24 studies, we identified the following themes to be relevant to improving mental health outcomes. First, early intervention following amputation. Early intervention help provide patients with strategies to cope with their limb loss. Social networks. Having others who understood what it was like to be limb different, particularly in rehabilitation centers. Social support. Having family members and friends who could provide support following limb loss helped to shield some of the negative mental health effects. Positive coping. Focusing on positive coping and reframing to see opportunity rather than challenge was another strategy recommended by the literature. And finally, improving mobility. Individuals reported less depression and anxiety if they were able to develop ways to improve their mobility. So what can we take away from these results? These themes provided useful information in thinking about the ways in which occupational therapy can provide intervention and target mental health. As a result, the client should experience increased quality of life, which positively impacts their mental health. Occupational therapy focuses on the following. Occupations such as dressing, medication management, sleep and work, environmental context, both natural and man-made, personal factors such as age and race, performance patterns such as roles and routines, performance skills such as reaching and grasping, and client factors such as values and beliefs. Occupational therapy views each client through a holistic lens and focuses on care that is specific to the client living their most meaningful life, which is a cornerstone for positive mental health. Questions or comments can be directed to me or my co-author. Contact information is provided. These are our references and thank you so much for this opportunity.
Hi everyone, my name is Corey Mitchell. I'm a graduate student here at Arkansas State University in the nursing program, seeking my degree as a family nurse practitioner. My quality improvement project is titled a rural clinics breast cancer screening rate versus the national average. So just a little background, what is breast cancer? Breast cancer is a type of cancer that begins in the breast, can be seen on an x-ray or felt as a lump. It's the most common cancer diagnosis among women. It's the second leading cause of cancer death among women. So I threw in this slide here, you can just kind of see how breast cancer ranks up against other common cancers diagnosed in women, and you can see it's way ahead of all the others. So who does breast cancer affect? Breast cancer affects women. However, men can be affected by breast cancer as well. The most vulnerable age group is women ages 45 to 74 years. There are risk factors for uh, breast cancer. There's unmodifiable risk factors, meaning those we can't change, like being a female, aging, inheriting certain genes, having a family history or a personal history of breast cancer, being Caucasian, and there's many others. Um, there are modifiable risk factors. These are things that you can change to help decrease your risk of developing breast cancer. These include smoking, drinking alcohol, being overweight or overweight or obese, um, no physical activity, no paris, meaning never being pregnant or having the first pregnancy after the age of 30. And there's many others there that you can change to help decrease your risk. So why is breast cancer screening important? It's a no-brainer. Early detection saves lives. The sooner you get in and get your screening, if anything is found, the earlier it's detected, the easier life is going to be to save. When should breast cancer screening begin? The American Cancer Society suggests that women between 40 and 44 have the option to start screening every year. 45 to 54 should have a mammogram every year. And women 55 and older should be, can begin to have a mammogram every other year. The United States Preventive Ta Services Task Force, they suggest that women ages 40 to 49 choose on their own individual basis if they want to have a mammogram every other year, or, yeah, every two years. And then they recommend every two years a women, women ages 50 to 74 have a mammogram. So as of 2018, the breast cancer um, mammography screening rate, the national average was 63%. So where can women receive information regarding breast cancer screening? Well, your primary care provider, physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, they should all know this information. Um, your OBGYN, when you go get a checkup with your OBGYN, they can give you all the information regarding breast cancer screening. And once they see us, the providers, we can give them information regarding, regarding the American Cancer Society website, the United States Preventative Service Task Force website, or even websites like Susan G. Conan, where they can gain more information on breast cancer and breast cancer screening. But like I said here, it starts with us as the provider. The quality improvement project I did took place in Blavel, Arkansas. I took 50 random charts and I reviewed the clinic visits from November 1st, 2019 to November 1st, 2020 in women ages 40, between the ages 45 to 74 who did or did not seek screening within that year. And my results, women ages 45 through 74 in this clinic in Blavel, the, the results was only 26%. As you can see here, of the 50 charts I took only 13 women had a mammogram, 37 of them did not seek screening. So how can a nurse practitioner make a difference? Again, a no-brainer. Educate, educate, educate. It starts with us, the providers, also the clinic administrators to identify where we're deficient in certain practices to where we can educate these patients and help improve their overall health in the female population. So I kind of threw this slide in there. It just kind of shows you that every three minutes, a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer. Every 13 minutes, a woman loses her life to breast cancer. Um, and it kind of shows you and estimates the number of women going to be diagnosed with breast cancer, the number of men going to be diagnosed with breast cancer, and things you can do to help decrease your risk of developing breast cancer. So that is my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and I hope you all do your screening like you're supposed to. Thank you. My name is Chrissy Overshine, and I'm a family nurse practitioner student at Arkansas State University. The title of my quality improvement project is Analysis of a Local Clinic's Prescribing Practices for Metformin 
in type 2 diabetics. As an introduction, I would like to inform that diabetes has become a pandemic that affects individuals worldwide, including 34.2 million people in the United States. This is approximately 10.5% of the population. This number also does not include type 1 diabetics, those with gestational diabetes, pre-diabetics, or those who are diabetic but have not been diagnosed. So as a provider, we like to suggest lifestyle changes for our patients first. But when diet and exercise has failed, metformin is the first-line therapy, according to the American Diabetes Association. So metformin is the most used oral anti-diabetic medication, and it has been for over 40 years. It is cost-effective, and it has the least amount of side effects, with the most common side effect being diarrhea. Di uh, diabetics should strive for a hemoglobin A1C of less than 6.5, and metformin can help them achieve this goal. Also, metformin has been found to be beneficial against cancers like breast cancer, endometrial cancer, bone cancer, colorectal cancer, and melanoma. It is also used in uh, obesity, liver disease, cardiovascular disease, and renal diseases. So the purpose of this quality improvement project is to analyze prescribing practices for metformin in patients with type 2 diabetes in a clinic here in Jonesboro. I wanted to compare the average number of patients on metformin with the national average that is 50 to 70%. This quality improvement project was conducted utilizing a retrospective chart review. The inclusion criteria consisted of individuals aged 40 to 70 with a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. 40 random patient charts were examined and data was gathered that included age, gender, race, and medication lists. All charts reviewed were of patients that had already been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. So I was proud to see that out of the 40 charts that were reviewed, 28 of the patients were on metformin. This is 70%. And again, the national average and goal is 50 to 70%. In conclusion, the information presented is beneficial because it reminds providers that metformin remains the first line treatment in diabetes type 2. Providers are reminded of the ADA guidelines and can use the guidelines as a goal in their own practices. References for this pre presentation are available upon request and this concludes my quality improvement project information. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tiffany Sark, and the title of my project is A Local Rural Clinic's Low-Dose Computed Tomography Screening Rate in 30-Pack Year Smokers Aged 55 to 80. The purpose of my quality improvement project is to shed some light on a screening that I felt was being underutilized in my community, to educate providers on the importance of implementing these screenings, and to encourage providers to educate their patients on the importance of compliance and following through with their recommended screenings. First, I would like to note that statistics have changed since my project began, and therefore this presentation will reflect those changes. 
Did you know that lung cancer is now the second most diagnosed cancer and that it is still number one in cancer-related deaths in both men and women? The United States Preventive Services Task Force recommends that individuals identified as high risk receive an annual low-dose computer tomography screening, also known as a CAT scan. The task force grades this screening as a B rating because there is a high certainty of a moderate to substantial benefit to the patient. An advantage to offering and performing this screening includes earlier detection of lung cancer when compared to chest radiographs, thus resulting in earlier treatment and improved morbidity and mortality rates. Unfortunately, for the American Lung Association in 2019, only 4.2% of qualifying high-risk individuals were screened. Sadly, but unsurprisingly, Arkansas ranked even worse at 2.5%. This led me to question, how well are our clinics screening high-risk individuals in my community specifically? Who qualifies? Currently, as of March 9th, 2021, high-risk individuals are identified as adults between the age of 50 and 80, have a 20 pack year history of smoking and are a current smoker or have quit within the last 15 years. This has changed from the previous 55 to 80 years of age and 30 pack year history guidelines. My methodology used a retrospective chart review of approximately 50 patients who visited the clinic between the dates of May 15, 2020 and November 15, 2020. The results. As I previously mentioned, I felt that this screening was being underutilized in my community. Unfortunately, my data reflects such. I ended up reviewing approximately 56 charts. I disqualified individuals who had received CTs for known history of or current cancers. And after collecting 50 prime examples of individuals who would be deemed high risk per the task force, not one patient had received a low dose computed tomography screening as a preventative measure for lung cancer. More specifically, none of these individuals had received any type of CT of the chest, including with contrast, without contrast, et cetera, as a preventative measure. Incidentally, there was one individual who received a CT without contrast for further workup of a lung mass after having a coronary artery calcium score screening, which is a grade I or insufficient evidence screening. While I was not super surprised that the percentage at this clinic was as low as it was, it allowed me to be more knowledgeable in this area of expertise and to be able to discuss the pros and cons of this preventative screening. I feel that my contribution includes identifying an underutilized USPSTF recommended screening guideline in my community, that I have been encouraging providers to consider implementing this screening into their practice, and that I have encouraged providers to educate their patients on the importance of compliance and following through with their individualized screening recommendations, not just this one specifically. And this will conclude my presentation on a local rural clinic's low dose commuted tomography screening rate in 30 pack year smokers aged 55 to 80. I am Deborah Schulte, a doctorate of nursing practice student at Arkansas State University. I would like to present my translation project titled Utilization of a Statin Therapy Initiation Clinical Decision Aid in a Rural Health Clinic Analysis and Implementation. Low density lipoprotein elevation is a primary risk factor for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, which results in heart disease and stroke the leading and fifth leading causes of death in the United States, costing $320 billion annually in direct medical cost. In 2016, there were 660,000 new coronary events in the United States and another 305,000 recurrent events. The background of this project is inspired by an observation that women may not be getting the same medical care when it comes to heart health. A national cohort study of women in the VA healthcare system discussed female patients were less likely to receive a statin drug compared to men and less likely to have an LDL of less than 100. Research demonstrates the need for earlier screening and LDL reduction in young women. Healthy People 2020 goals are to improve cardiac and vascular disease through prevention, 
detection and treatment of risk factors for heart attack and stroke. The idea for the project started by considering is there a way to consistently make sure women have access to statin drugs? This project question emerged. In a family practice setting, can implementation of a clinical decision aid improve consistency of statin initiation and use in women? As the literature strongly indicates, dyslipidemia has a direct correlation to atherosclerotic heart disease. This project will explore and evaluate the use of an evidence-based clinical practice guideline in the form of a clinical decision aid to see if this will improve statin initiation in women with an LDL of greater or equal to 130. Thousands of studies in the literature review were sifted through and three different themes emerged, identifying risk factors and risk assessment, screening and results, lifestyle modifications, and treatment options. Stakeholders identified include the providers, the recipients of the statin medication, family members, insurance agencies, pharmacies and pharmaceutical distributors, and governmental agencies that dictate policy. The collaborative team will include one DNP student, which is the primary investigator, one medical assistant to help with data collection, the team of providers that will implement the clinical practice guideline, and a faculty mentor at A State. The facility for the project will take place in a rural family clinic in North Central Arkansas. The methods and strategic plan started with deciding the inclusion criteria, women ages 25 to 60 with LDL greater or equal to 130. The 2018 guideline and management of blood cholesterol was chosen and translated into a clinical decision aid for use by the providers. The guidelines were presented as well as the clinical decision aid discussed. Collaborative provider input was shared, education was given to the providers, and questions answered. A baseline and four-week post-implementation chart review was performed to compare. The clinical decision aid starts with girls and women of all ages emphasizing lifestyle, diet, exercise, and weight management. Based on the women's particular risk factor or current disease process, the statin can be started by the following recommendations. This guideline is comprehensive and focuses on prevention as well as treatment. Desired results were better consistency on statin initiation. 50 pre-implementation retrospective chart evaluations conclude a statin baseline use of 24% in the population. A four-week post-implementation chart review found 88% of the population was offered or taken a statin medication. This project has been an amazing opportunity to grow professionally by leading a team of nurse practitioners and physicians in a family practice clinic to reduce LDL in women and ultimately reduce the risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Using a clinical decision aid translated from the current guidelines for early screening and identification of at-risk women, as well as early initiation of a statin drug, will help close the research practice gap by driving provider treatment consistency to ensure the best possible outcomes for reduction of LDL and ultimately heart and vascular disease. This project meets the standards of care of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement Framework for optimizing healthcare called the IHI Triple Aim by valuing the patient as a participant in their own healthcare decisions, improving women's heart health by lowering LDL and lowering the risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and reducing heart and vascular disease expenditures by reducing occurrence. Please see the references listed below and let me know if you have any questions, thank you. Hello, my name is Tamika Sledge. I am a family nurse practitioner student in the master's program here at Arkansas State University. Today, I am presenting my quality improvement project titled, Analysis of Childhood Obesity Screenings at a primary care clinic in Western Tennessee. The purpose of this quality improvement project is to determine if a local clinic in Western Tennessee is assessing pediatric patients for obesity. This is very important as childhood obesity is associated with a higher chance of premature death and disability in adulthood. Currently, over 13 million children in the United States are obese. The United States Preventive Task Force has declared this an epidemic and urges providers to screen all children for obesity. This PowerPoint will include objectives related to the definitions, cause, complications, and management of obesity. What is obesity? The World Health Organization defines obesity and overweight as 
and abnormal or excessive fat accumulation to the extent that healthcare may be impaired. There are several causes of obesity. One cause is genetics. Many parents with obesity often have children that may become obese. This is due to sedentary lifestyles. Other genetics include a child born with Down syndrome. That child has a higher risk of lower metabolic rates, which increase their risk of obesity. Fast food is inexpensive and kids love it. It's quick, it's easy, and it tastes good, but it is also filled with saturated fats, high carbs, and sugars. Obesity has several complications. Those include a bad social life, cancers, hypertension, high cholesterol, sleep apnea, respiratory problems, quality of life, and coronary heart disease. A bad social life is one of the greatest complications in a school age kid. Many obese children are bullied due to being overweight and not able to perform in team sports as those that are more physically fit. This can sometimes lead to depression. In managing obesity, it, several factors are included, such as body mass index, which is also known as the BMI, recommended well child screenings, exercise, diet control, and screen time limitations. For the purpose of this study, the focus will mainly be on the body mass index. My preceptor analyzes obesity with obtaining BMIs on every patient, including pediatrics. The BMI is a value derived from the mass and height of a patient. A healthy BMI is when a, is when a child is in the fifth to 85th percentile. This project was completed using a retrospective chart review on 20 random selected charts with office encounters between September and November of 2020. The inclusion criteria was children between the ages of six and 18. Data collected included age, gender, race, and verification if a BMI was documented. The results of this quality improvement project indicate this clinic employs child obesity screenings on 100% of its encounters. Of those reviewed, 40% were males and 60% were females. Furthermore, 80% was black, 10% white, and the other 10% were Hispanics. It is so important to screen all children for obesity as this will prevent long-term problems, both physically and socially in the future. We want our children happy and healthy. This is one way to do it. This concludes my quality improvement presentation. Thank you. Hello, my name is Carmen Smith. I'm a Dean P student here at Arkansas State University. I'm gonna give you an overview of the evidence-based practice project I've worked over, on over the last few semesters called Improving the Emergency Department Quality of Care. Demand for care in the emergency department has continued to increase over recent years. This has caused a crisis in emergency medicine and often overwhelms healthcare facilities. Overcrowding is very common and often described in press. Overcrowding is just any time that the demand exceeds the supply of resources. Consequences include treatment delays, threats to patient privacy and dignity, increased mortality, increased length of stay, and left without being seen rates. Evidence found in literature suggests that improving the knowledge of ED triage staff and use of provider and triage can reduce length of stay and left without being seen. Current ED flow processes are often inefficient and ED triage staff are unaware of the critical need to focus on flow. This project sought to improve the knowledge of ED triage staff regarding flow processes and common reasons for leaving without being seen and introduced this process redesign with the provider and triage. For the background, crowding has become a significant and widespread, widespread problem. Crowding is a significant patient safety issue as well. Consequences include ED boarding of admitted patients and poor health outcomes. The literature indicates that the provider and triage can reduce episodes of left without being seen in the emergency department. Current literature did support the interventions used in the project. The literature reported that wait times were determined to be the main reason that patients left. Communication and positive interactions are important, and the provider and triage can be a quick and easy screening tool. 
The theory used in the project was the Donnie Beatty and Quality of Care Framework. It included structural process and outcomes measures. Key concepts were length of stay, left without being seen, triage, provider and triage, and ED overcrowding. The triage area is the area in the front of the emergency department where a rapid assessment happens with a, a registered nurse. Resources included financial support, the project time and plan, stakeholders with the ED patients and staff. The team included an APRN and LPM. LPN, the project was 30 days in length. The provider and triage cost about $32,000 a month, a 3% left without being seen rate, $48,000, significantly more. For methods, the IRB provided approval from both Arkansas State University and St. Bernard's Medical Center. The triage staff were educated, then they worked with the provider and triage team. Length of stay, length of stay and left without being seen episodes were compared before and after the project implementation. Shapiro Wilk tests were used to determine if the data sets were symmetrical. The T two tailed T test was utilized to compare the two data sets, as well as an asymmetrical test with the Man Whitney U test. Results indicated that ED length of stay had a median of 255 minutes before the project and 239, after, 239 minutes afterward. The two tailed T test did indicate a significant p value at 0.04 with the predetermined value of 0 0.05. ED triage staff education pretest, the scores were 98.5%, afterward 100%. The p-value was 0.64, which unfortunately was not significant. Left without being seen indicated 64 episodes before the project implementation and 29 minutes after 29 episodes after implementation. A man went knee U test indicated a p-value of 0.06 which was not significant with a p-value of 0 0.05. Significance of the project for nursing includes the impact of a reduction in length of stay and left without being seen rates. For patients, the significance is shorter wait times, increased satisfaction and overall better health outcomes. For the organization, for the lower rates of left without being seen and decreased episodes of length of, length of stay includes increase, increased revenue and fewer patient complaints. The project does support an inter the integration of the doctor of nursing practice in a trio of roles, including the APRN, the leader and change agent. In conclusion, the summary of the project findings does, did indicate a reduction in length of stay and left without being seen rates at the project site. Implementations, implications for future practice include opportunities to replicate the results in other emergency departments. Further studies, however, are needed to determine if the interventions can be successfully replicated. Thank you for your time and attention today. I've included a link to the references of the project here on the last slide. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Tara Stoner and I am in the Family Nurse Practitioner Program at Arkansas State University. My quality improvement project is titled Low Dose CT Screenings for Lung Cancer, a work in progress. In the year 2013, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommended implementing the utilization of low-dose CT scans for patients who are at high risk for developing lung cancer. Individuals noted to be at the highest risk were those aged 55 to 80 with a 30 or more pack year smoking history. The purpose of this quality improvement project was to evaluate a local family practice clinic's compliance with the recommended screenings and then compare the results with the national data. A retrospective chart review is completed within the local clinic in Northeast Arkansas for the calendar year of 2018. The data was gathered from the electronic health records of all high-risk patients who were seen that year to evaluate the providers in this clinic and how compliant they were with the preventative scans. The data from that year for the national average was 12.5%. Now, the local clinic average for recommended screenings in 2018 was only 10%. The local patients who actually met the criteria that were not screened was 25%. Some of the limitations that we ran into within this local clinic was that most of the patients had no smoking history 
recorded at all. That accounted for 7% of the low-dose CT lung cancer screenings that were ordered. One patient that had a low-dose CT screening was noted to have less than a 30-pack year smoking history. And that leaves only two patients that met the criteria and received the low-dose CT scan. That's a total of 2% of the patients seen in the local clinic in 2018 that met the inclusion criteria for a high-risk patient and received the recommended screening. To show you on the charts, that is the national patient data was 12.5% compliance and 87.5% non-compliance for high-risk patients who received or did not receive a LODO CT screening. For the local clinic, the two is the only two patients who met the criteria and received the CT scan. The eight is the patients who received a CT scan but had no PAC smoking history recorded. The 26 is the patients who met the age compliance, the, low, the smoking history compliance, but did not receive a LODO CT scan. The 65 is the number of patients who met the age range, but had no smoking history noted. The benefits that are provided from this quality improvement project is that it should raise awareness with providers when they can see where they fall short from the recommendations. This should also bring attention to what these providers can do to reduce the mortality rates that are associated with lung cancer. The project should also bring attention to the importance of gathering smoking history from all patients, especially those who are aged 55 and above. The long-term benefit is the greatest benefit, and that is for the patients. It should lead to a reduction of late-stage lung cancer diagnoses, which will also lead to slower progression rates, lower risks of mortality, and overall patient wellness. And that is our goal. Thank you, and I appreciate your attention today. Good afternoon. My name is Lori Strider and the title of my project is Percentage of Type 1 Diabetes Following American Diabetes Association Treatment Recommendations. I am a, a family nurse practitioner student at Arkansas State. This subject is of great interest to me both personally and professionally. On a professional level, I have eight years experience in diabetes education and was once a certified diabetes educator. On a personal level, my mother lived with type 1 diabetes for over 60 years, and our 19-year-old son currently lives with type 1 diabetes. He uses an insulin pump and a continuous glucose monitor to manage his blood sugars. The purpose of this project is to determine what percentage of type 1 diabetes patients in a family practice clinic in North Central Arkansas are following treatment recommendations from the American Diabetes Association. In 2019, the American Diabetes Association changed their standards for medical care in diabetes to make either basal bolus analog insulin or insulin pumps a grade A treatment recommendation for type 1 diabetes. The motivation behind this project is a 30% rise in type 1 diabetes cases we have seen since 2017, coupled with the fact that there have been significant advances in options for treating this disease. Insulin pumps have been available widespread since 2005. This complex technology more closely matches the physiologic function of the insulin producing cells of the pancreas. Advances in this technology are being made daily. In fact, there are currently insulin pumps that communicate with continuous glucose monitors and use algorithms to keep blood glucose within prescribed levels, in essence, an artificial pancreas. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease marked by destruction of the beta cells, which are the insulin producing cells of the pancreas. The cause of type 1 diabetes is multifactorial. Genetics and environment both play a role. It is thought that a trigger in the environment, such as a virus, provokes this autoimmune destruction of the beta cells. 
An interesting note, there is a limited small study being done currently in the United Kingdom that reflects a bump up in type one diabetes cases post COVID. This project is important because these recommendations are based on years of scientific evidence that blood glucose control is better when they are followed. Better blood glucose control equals fewer complications and fewer complications represents an important and improved quality of life and lower medical costs long-term. This is particularly valuable in type one diabetes because 60% of these patients are diagnosed before age 14 and thus have potentially many years to live. The famous landmark study, Diabetes Control and Complications Trial or DCCT from 1993 proved that better blood glucose control lessens the likelihood of retinopathy. Retinopathy is the destruction of retinal vessels behind the eyes, which if left unchecked will lead to blindness eventually. Other scientific studies done since 1993 have proven that blood sugar control also lessens the occurrence of complications such as nephropathy or the destruction of the filtering units of the kidneys, the nephrons. Overall, keeping blood glucose control <clears throat> under recommended levels makes for a greater quality of life and fewer costly complications. A report published by the Endocrine Society in 2014 projects a gap of 1,484 endocrinologists by 2025. There's simply just not enough of them to go around. Consequently, family practice providers must step up and help fill the gap and manage, or at very least, manage this disease. This project was a retrospective data collection. It was done over a 10 month period of time. 62 patient charts were examined to determine the treatment plan that was being followed. 62 patient charts with the ICD-10 code of E10 were examined with the following results. And honestly, they were quite surprising. 47% of patients used a basal or bolus insulin regimen. 35% of patients were using an insulin pump and 18% were using non-analog insulins. A total of 82% were following American Diabetes Association treatment recommendations for type one diabetes. That is a surprising part to me. In a family practice clinic in North Central Arkansas, 82% of their type one patients are following ADA's treatment recommendations. Only 18% were not following treatment recommendations. The implications for this study are many. Uh, first of all, the family practice where this quality improvement project took place, the clinic could use this information. Their marketer could take this information and share this positive data with the public as they promote the clinic. It also adds to the knowledge regarding how many patients are following ADA's treatment recommendations and potential future nursing research projects could use this as a starting point for more in-depth study into the treatment of type 1 diabetes. Thank you for your attention and have a great day. Hello, my name is Kakisha Taylor. I'm an FNP student at Arkansas State University. The title of my quality improvement project is Evaluation of Lifestyle Changes on lowering blood glucose levels prior to the initiation of metformin therapy. Diabetes-related deaths have been on the rise in the United States. On an average, there are 80,000 reported deaths annually related to diabetes. The cost of care will increase if proactive measures are not implemented. Efforts to prevent the chronic condition are targeted at lowering glucose levels and stopping the progression from prediabetes to type two diabetes. The suggested approach as recommended by the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists is to perform three to six months of lifestyle modifications before medication management. 
Experts contend modifications in daily living are essential and first line practices for achieving glycemic targets. Specific lifestyle changes recommended are those of weight loss, physical activity, dietary modifications, smoking cessation, and self-care education. Efforts to prevent type 2 diabetes should begin systematically before diagnosis. Flattening the curve of the rise of diabetes would give the percentages a drastic weakening and increase life longevity. In 2018, 8.2% of the population in the United States had diagnosed diabetes. Also in 2018, in adults aged 18 years and older, the number of patients with prediabetes was estimated to be 88 million. The purpose of this quality improvement project is to analyze the compliance with AACE recommendations for initiating lifestyle modification therapy prior to starting metformin in prediabetic patients in a primary care clinic in rural Mississippi. Lifestyle therapy has been noted and duly expected to lower blood glucose levels and prevent type 2 diabetes. Compliance with the proposed strategies has shown a 27% patient success rate compared to metformin's reduction rate of 31% over three years. A retrospective chart review was conducted on approximately 25 charts with visits from January 1st, 2020 to November the 1st, 2020 to gather data for this project. The exclusion criteria uh, included all patients under the age of 18 and all patients over the age of 65 years old and all non-established patients. As you can see here with the pie charts, with the established patients with prediabetes with the ICD-10 code of R7303 was 40%. And the established patients with diabetes ICD-10 code E11.9 was at 60%. Here are four pie charts that distinguish the lifestyle modifications, um, the blood glucose levels before the modifications, after the modifications, before metformin and after metformin. The graphs show the reduction in fasting blood glucose levels were significantly lower in patients who adhered to the lifestyle modification versus those who were prescribed metformin. Establishing and understanding the importance of adherence to evidence-based recommendations provide encouraging results. This information will be useful to the clinic in determining the extent of adherence to the recommendations. This project will also allow the clinic to set goals for future education and prescribing practices. Providers are encouraged to provide more focused care to those patients with abnormal glucose levels. Offering the lifestyle modifications before metformin therapy initiation has the potential to increase overall self-care responsibility and decrease blood glucose levels in the high-risk population. The overall focus, considering limitations, is to secure advances in glycemic control as medical evidence and clinical guidelines are developed on all platforms. Morbidity rates will be lowered and premature mortality prevented. Acknowledgements uh, to the Oakland Medical Clinic and also to my faculty mentor, Ms. Randy Davis. References available upon request. This concludes my quality improvement project. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Elizabeth Thomason, a doctorate of nursing practice student at Arkansas State University. I'm here today to present my project entitled Aiming for Accuracy in Penicillin Allergy Diagnoses. This project was completed in spring of 2021. The diagnosis of penicillin allergic is very often given inappropriately or incorrectly. In clinical practice, it can be extremely common to see a penicillin allergy listed in a patient's chart. In the clinic where this project took place, only generic allergy questioning is done during the triage process. Multiple research studies show that over 90% of those labeled as penicillin allergic 
would be able to tolerate penicillin containing products without a hypersensitivity reaction. The project question, can a, can a penicillin allergy screening tool and patient educational brochure increase patient knowledge regarding penicillin allergies and decrease rates of inaccurately, inaccurately diagnosed penicillin allergies? The project aims to promote accuracy in penicillin allergy diagnoses, to better educate patients and providers regarding penicillin allergies, to promote better provider patient communication regarding penicillin allergies. This project took place at Sherwood Urgent and Family Care in Searcy, Arkansas during the spring semester of 2021. A quick literature review, Devshawn et al. 2019 demonstrated that the use of a more effective beta-lactame antibiotic allergy assessment tool improved provider knowledge and better prescribing practices. Stesu et al. 2016 also demonstrated a significant decrease in the prescribing of a much more expensive antibiotic and better use of penicillin once a penicillin allergy assessment tool was implemented. Jose and Ishmael, 2017, noted a significant increase in patient knowledge regarding penicillin allergies upon implementation of a patient educational material. This was a quality improvement project. Patients were screened for the inclusion criteria and the allergy screening tool was utilized. Patients were then given a patient educational brochure upon leaving the triage area and the triage staff member then gave the completed screening tool to the provider. The patient and provider then had the opportunity to discuss the allergy. Out of 31 eligible participants, 28 fully participated in the project with the remaining three declining provider-led participation. Of those 28 participants, 27 reported an increase in knowledge about their penicillin allergies based on provider reports. No change in allergy status was documented in the participants' electronic medical records. However, two participants were prescribed penicillin-containing products after discussions with their provider. No significant increase in time was seen in participants' visit links when compared to a random sampling of non-participant visits, 53.27 minutes for participants, versus 52.52 minutes for non-participants. This project was implemented successfully and the clinic staff and providers were able to easily utilize the project tools for their reports. I was very pleased with the results of this project and felt that it demonstrated a successful transfer of knowledge from research to clinic practice. As a nurse leader, I will be in a position to continue implementing this project in this clinic as well as potentially implementing future quality improvement projects that can benefit nursing practice. This particular work expounds upon the work of others as demonstrating the effectiveness of utilizing more effective allergy screening tools and patient education material to aim for more precise accuracy in diagnosing penicillin allergies. Thank you for the opportunity to present my project today. Hello and welcome to my presentation. I'm Alexis Tibbs, a graduate student at Arkansas State University, and I'll be presenting a Rural Clinic's cervical cancer screening rate versus the national average. The purpose of my project is to identify the cervical cancer screening rate of female patients aged 21 to 65 in a rural family practice compared to the national average of 81.1%. Cervical cancer is the fourth leading cause of death in women worldwide. Um, this is a major factor as to why I chose this as my project. Uh, clinical screening rates show providers where they can improve and help guide focused education and changes in their implementation strategies in order to increase their cervical cancer screening rates. And cervical cancer is certainly preventable with screenings and that is why uh, we recommend them to be done. Um, guidelines for cervical cancer screening in the United States is uh, recommended by the United States Preventive Services Task Force and other uh, organizations. And they recommend that women aged 21 to 29 years old receive cervical cytology alone every three years. And that is what we call a pap smear. 
Um, women aged 30 to 65 be screened every three years with the pap smear, cervical cytology, or every five years with uh, HPV testing alone or HPV testing with cervical cytology. And HPV testing is important because there are certain strains of the human papilloma virus that are known to be a very high risk for causing cervical cancer. Methodology for this project was a retrospective chart review. I reviewed 50 female patients, exclusion criteria involved. If the, if the patient had a history of having a hysterectomy, they no longer are screened for cervical cancer. Inclusion criteria, female, 21 to 65 of age, no history of having a hysterectomy, so they still have a cervix. Um, and then I just gathered data based on, is the patient up to date uh, per guidelines? or do they have a refusal on chart? The data gathered uh, showed a result compared to the national cervical cancer screening rate of 81.1%. The rural clinic had a lower screening rate of 70%. And this is significantly important because Arkansas as a whole state has been below the national rate for years. And it's important for providers to understand this in order to make changes in implementation and get our screening rates to be higher. Contribution to society, we can identify those at increased risk for HPV and provide them proper education on how to decrease their risks. We can screen women based on national guidelines in order to detect HPV or cancer cells. And in order to do that, we have to um, identify what our rates are and how we can improve them. And then screening allows us to treat early to halt progression and to hopefully prevent precancer cells from turning into cervical cancer. And this slide is just some education that I included, things that increase a female's risk for developing cervical cancer from HPV is a sexual activity at a young age, a woman with more sexual partners, suppressed immune system, a high parity, a long-term use of oral contraceptives or cigarette smoking. And these women who are at a higher risk, um, they tend to need more frequent testing. So it's important to identify that and for a patient to understand their increased risk in order to comply with uh, recommendations for screening. And then factors that can decrease incidence of cervical cancer due to HPV are early detection, which is screening per the national recommendations. And then um, there is a vaccination available for both males and females. And so education regarding this is important. And use of condoms to decrease the uh, transmission rate of HPV and other sexually transmitted infections. And these are my list of references and I look forward to answering any of your questions and thank you for watching my presentation. Hello, my name is Tracy Tucker. I'm a family nurse practitioner student. My quality improvement project was over screening for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Alpha-1 Antitrypsin deficiency is a co-dominant genetic type of COPD. It is caused by the mutation of the Serpentina 1 gene. This means both parents have to have been carriers for the patient to have the disease. Um, it is treated with augmentation therapy, which means a weekly infusion of plasma purified alpha-1 antitrypsin for the rest of their life once they are uh, diagnosed. Um, the treatment, unfortunately, does not improve their symptoms. What it does is slows down progression of the disease. Um, disease symptoms are very similar to typical COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patients, such as patients who have severe shortness of breath, cough, wheezing. Some of them are oxygen dependent. Um, often this type of COPD is not diagnosed until it's very severe. Um, my purpose of this project was to compare the percentages of testing in a rural health clinic to the national average of about 10%. Um, we know the more patients that are tested, more cases will be found, and this helps with 
uh, prevention of disease progression. And it also helps when we find someone with animal alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency that their younger family members can also be tested maybe even before they start showing symptoms. Um, my methodology uh, was a retrospective audit of charts for a two-year period of any patient who was 18 years and older with a diagnosis of COPD. Um, the data was collected via chart audit. Um, we collected the dates they were seen, whether or not they had a diagnosis of COPD by looking at their ICD-10 codes. Um, their age, their gender, and whether or not they were positive for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Um, excluded patients were any patients under the age of 18 or who did not have a diagnosis of COPD. And this is just a sample of my collection tool. Um, the results I got, only two patients out of the 75 eligible patients um, were actually tested. That was about 2.6%. The national testing rate is 10%, so we were below the national testing rate at this particular clinic. This helps reinforce the need for provider education on the importance of testing for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Uh, benefits of testing, um, you know, we want to educate uh, patients and providers on earlier testing. This facilitates earlier identification so that the disease can be treated earlier and slow the progression. And this preserves quality of life and longevity of life for patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. It also aids in genetic counseling for young adults who may be considering starting a family, wanting to know if they're a carrier of this disease before deciding about having children. And we also wanna educate the children of someone who has this, that they may also be a carrier or have the disease themselves so that they would follow a healthy lifestyle and make good lifestyle choices. These are the references of all of the um, research that I did on alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And I really appreciate your time and really am passionate about this particular disease and the process. Thank you. Hello, my name is Shay Tyler. The title of my project is Evaluation of a Rural Family Practice Clinic's Compliance with Hepatitis C Screening Recommendations. Hepatitis D virus is one of the most common viruses in the United States with 2.4 million estimated cases in 2020. More than half of infected individuals do not even know that they are infected. Current recommendations for screening um, include screening patients who were born between 1945 and 1965. Um, despite this information and recommendations, screening for hepatitis C virus remains low. The purpose of this quality improvement project is to compare hepatitis C screening rates of a local family practice clinic in Greene County, Arkansas to the national average of 17.3%. Uh, hepatitis C virus is one of the most common viruses in the United States. Um, as mentioned before, 2.4 million estimated cases uh, were in 2020. Um, more than half of people with hepatitis C virus do not realize they have the virus. Um, placing them at risk for life-threatening liver disease, cancer, and unknowingly transmitting the virus to others. The methodology that I used for this uh, quality improvement project was a retrospective chart review um, to analyze screening compliance. Uh, data was gathered from the electronic health records of 25 random patient charts of patients born between 1945 and 1965. Um, this data was compared with the national average of 17.3% for baby boomers. Um, charts were reviewed for office encounters from January 1st of 2015 to August 25th of 2020. Inclusion criteria included age, gender, and whether or not there was documentation for hepatitis C virus in the patient's chart. The results compared to the national average was 0%. Um, the clinic, patients in the clinic were not screened for hepatitis C virus um, due to their age or when they were born between 1945 and 1965. Um, patients who were um, hepatitis C virus positive were only found to be positive due to presenting symptoms 
such as um, abdominal pain or elevated lab results such as um, elevated liver enzymes. Um, the information revealed that the family practice clinic did not partake in screening for hepatitis C virus in patients born between 1945 and 1965. Um, of all the screens that were done, mammograms and PSAs were one of them, but hepatitis C virus was not one that we would typically see recommended um, for these patients. Um, contribution to the community. Um, this information can be an added benefit to the clinic and the community by ensuring that families practice providers have the information needed to identify deficits for screening for hepatitis C virus, and it helps improve the screening process and overall patient health. And this uh, concludes my presentation. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Salima Valiani and I am in the Family Nurse Practitioner Program at Arkansas State University. My quality improvement project is titled Breast Cancer Screening Rate in a Local Clinic versus the National Average Screening Rate. Breast cancer is the most frequent cancer among women worldwide. It impacts about 2.1 million women each year, and it is the main cause of cancer-related death in women globally. Breast cancer is frequently diagnosed in women aged 55 to 64 years, and the median death age is 68 years. Early diagnosis is a key strategy in providing timely access to treatment and improving effective diagnostic services. The purpose of my quality improvement project is to compare mammography screening rates of women aged 50 to 74 years in a local family practice clinic in Little Rock, Arkansas, to the national average of 72.8% of women aged 50 to 74 years who are up to date on their mammography screenings. The National Cancer Institute has forecasted in a study that will be in, there will be an increase in U.S. breast cancer cases being diagnosed each year. The cases will grow from 283,000 cases in 2000, 2011 to 441,000 cases in 2030. That is more than a 50% increase. It is crucial that early screening is done through secondary prevention guidelines to prevent the projected increase of breast cancer. This project was conducted using a retrospective chart review and data was gathered from the electronic health records. 50 charts were reviewed and electronic and e-clinical was used to narrow search of charts based on gender, age, and mammogram status. Data was gathered from clinical visits occurring from January 11, 2020 to April 30th, 2020. So 50 patients met the inclusion criteria and were included in my project. After the completion of the statistical analysis that I did, it was found that the local clinic in Little Rock, Arkansas had a mammography screening rate of 36% for women aged 50 to 74 years, and 64% of patients in that clinic who were still not getting screenings per the guideline. As you can see, the national average was 72.8% of women aged 50 to 74 years who were up to date on mammography screenings. Limitations to the project included sample size of only 50 charts, and another limitation was the use of only one clinic. So from the data I got, from the 50 charts that were reviewed, only 18 charts showed patients who received mammography screenings. And out of those, 17 patients were from 60 to 74 year olds. 
and there was only one patient that was below 60 years old who got their mammogram screenings. My project concluded that women between the ages of 50 and to 74 years old in the clinic are below the national average. Primary care providers play a, play a pivotal role in increasing mammography screening adherence. It is possible for providers within this clinic to reach the national average through advocating and counseling. In conclusion, early diagnosis and screening is critical in detecting breast cancer and will benefit in reducing breast cancer mortality for approximately, by approximately 20%. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my quality improvement project. Hi, my name is Lauren Bond and I'm gonna be talking to you all about my quality improvement project titled A Local Clinic's Clinical Breast Exam Screening Rate versus Arkansas's Breast Care Average. I have a little background information about my project. Um, breast cancer continues to be a leading cause of cancer-related deaths among women in America today. And there's a lot of different professional organizations that vary slightly with recommendations of screening ages for um, women. But for this quality improvement project, I focused more on the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. So the past screening recommendations are as follows. The self-breast examination, which is at any age after 21 a clinical breast examination at any age after 21 and mammograms from 45 to 50 years old based on your history and risk factors. And the current screening rate, which is now after 2019, shows that the mammograms are a little bit earlier at 40 to 45 years of age. Again, based on your history and risk factors, um, show when you can initiate, how early you can initiate that examination. But they no longer recommend the clinical breast exam nor the self breast exam. And this was just because of research and literature that really showed that there was no benefits to the exam that outweighed potential risks. And these risks were like false positives, um, leading to unnecessary further testing, and then an increase in anxiety for the patient as they awaited these results of testing. So though breast cancer is more seen in older women, those who are younger can still be at risk for the development. In fact, those who have yet met parameters for mammograms or those aged 21 to 45 years of age can be at risk for breast cancer. And if developed, it tends to be a little bit more of an aggressive type of cancer just because of the cancer feeding off of estrogen in the woman's body, the natural produced estrogen, which means it can be more aggressive. It can spread a little bit quicker, metastasize a little bit easier, and then be a little bit harder to treat. So if the use of the clinical breast exam is no longer recommended, then how are we gonna better serve this population of women who don't yet meet parameters for a routine mammogram? So the purpose of this project was to compare the rate of the clinical breast examination in women who are aged 21 to 45 of a local clinic in Northeast Arkansas to that of Arkansas's breast care program of about 40.8%. The methodology used for this project followed a descriptive design method with a randomized convenience sampling of about 50 charts through a, 50 charts through a retrospective chart review. So I had the inclusion, exclusion, and additional data listed as follows. But in summary, the charts were selected based off of an ICD code that narrowed down to a well woman visit within the last year, and 50 charts were sampled from that year to see who of that population chose to have a clinical breast exam and who opted out of one. This data was then collected, analyzed, and compared to the Arkansas average. And the results are as follows. The local clinic screening rate was actually 76 point, 76% compared to the Arkansas breast care program, about 40.8%. So it showed about a 36% variance between the two. And some important information or just interesting information is of the six charts that showed a history of familial breast cancer, only one patient opted out of receiving that clinical breast examination. And then of the three charts that showed a prior abnormal screen through a clinical breast examination, those three continue to have a routine clinical breast examination at those well woman visits. So in conclusion, the local clinic has a higher rate of a clinical breast exam performed in 
performed in their clinic compared to that of Arkansas. And this can be interpreted as being seen as an important tool for women's health within that population. So if this tool is used for these women who are still considered at risk, it can help in identifying early forms of cancer and potentially lead to better outcomes for these women. So what can we take home from this? Well, the importance of educating these women about the risks and benefits of the tool should be discussed at every well woman office visit. So these patients can better make a decision on whether this exam is gonna be right for them. And that way they can lead to you know, further better outcomes if they were potentially to be diagnosed with this form of cancer. So thank you all for listening to my project. Here are my references. I look forward to answering any questions you guys might have and having a great day. Hi, my name is Samantha Weidman and the title of my project is Prevalence of Genetic Counseling and Testing in Women at High Risk for BRCA Related Cancers. And to give you a little bit of background information, the BRCA mutations are also called the breast cancer gene mutations, and there's BRCA1 and 2. These genetic mutations increase one's risk of not only breast cancer, but also ovarian, fallopian tube, peritoneal, and even prostate cancer in men. The breast cancer rates in Arkansas uh, run about 12.9% for total cancers in Arkansas per the Arkansas Department of Health. And about 2,300 women per year will be diagnosed in Arkansas. In the United States, over 276,000 women will be diagnosed. However, the mortality rate has dropped over 40% since 1989. Ovarian cancer does not occur quite that high of a rate. However, the mortality rate is over 50%. Of the 21,000 women that will be diagnosed every year, over 13,000 will die as a result of the ovarian cancer. In order to identify these women with the BRCA mutations prior to the formation of cancer, ideally, genetic testing is required. And in a study um, from Childers and others, it, they found that there's 1.2 to 1.3 million women who qualify for testing and have not had the testing done. However, in the group that did have genetic testing, genetic counseling was shown to increase the testing rates by 3.5 times the rate of those who had not had genetic counseling. So genetic counseling definitely has a very positive impact and increases the testing rate. Because of this and the fact that most primary care providers or roughly 80% already screen family history, the United States Preventative Services Task Force recommends that primary care providers use a tool such as the pedigree assessment tool or seven question family history screening tool to identify these patients at high risk for BRCA cancers or BRCA mutations, refer them to genetic counseling and find out if they do indeed qualify for testing and then further intervention. So the purpose of my study was to identify the rate that a clinic, primary care clinic in Central Arkansas is following these recommendations and then look at their genetic counseling and genetic testing rates. I did this through a retrospective chart review of 100 charts of women aged 21 to 80 years old and the visit dates were ranged from November of 2019 to November of 2020. And a, a search of their electronic medical record was conducted using keywords such as BRCA, genetics, and then the referral history. These pie charts break down both the diagnoses and the age groups for these women in the 100 chart review. And the older generation in breast cancer by far make up the greatest number, which is consistent with the statistics for Arkansas. My results revealed that only one patient out of the 100 was referred genetically, I mean, excuse me, re referred directly by primary care to genetic counseling. And it was a patient with only a family history of BRCA mutations. She was then identified to have BRCA mutations. So now further intervention can be planned for that patient. The primary care providers did have in the records though that 22 other women had testing by outside providers such as by their oncologists 
And 18 of those women had re record of genetic counseling being done. So you can definitely see a correlation between the counseling and the testing there. However, again, 1% or one out of 100 was referred directly by primary care. Um, the limitations of my study were that the clinic that I utilized for the study does not actually use a screening tool as recommended by the US Preventative Services Task Force. Some of the women also had a very remote cancer history. So in those charts, a few <clears throat> of the records may have been missing, which may be one reason why eight of the charts were unclear on whether or not genetic counseling was done or referral was made. However, this did identify a significant care gap for patients in the state, in the central area of Arkansas <clears throat> and shows us that more education is needed for providers. The screening tools need to be implemented so that these patients can be identified. These are my references. And thank you very much. Some presentations are the results of a classroom project, oral history, service training, assessment, journalism, or quality improvement activities. Such activities may have been deemed not to meet HHS OHRP definitions of human subject research designed to develop or contribute to generalizable knowledge and thus did not undergo IRB review. Evaluating strength gains in the upper extremity using blood flow restriction, exercise, and myofascial release. The researchers were Dr. Latoya Green, Ms. Joanna Cup, Mr. Eric West, pseudo researchers Catherine Thomas, Drake Parker, and Catherine Axon. The introduction and purpose of the study blood flow restriction is a technique used to improve muscle strength and hypertrophy in healthy individuals, post surgical patients, and recovering patients after an injury. Myofascial release, or MFR, is a hands-on technique used to eliminate pain and restore motion by applying gentle and sustained pressure to the myofascial connective tissue. This study is designed to assess the effects of MFR combined with BFR on the pectoralis major muscle. The hypothesis was that the strength gains would occur on the non-dominant pectoralis major muscle by the end of the study. The objectives of the study, this research study provides a more in-depth understanding of the effectiveness of BFR and MFR on strength gains in upper extremity musculature. Additionally, it allows potential implications for clinical practice, including the use of BFR with low intensity resistance training in populations who are unable to work at high intensity levels. The methods, the initial measurements consisted of the dynamometer and the one rep max test or one RM, in supine, a pectoral release using a cross-hand MFR technique was administered for four minutes. Then a green sleeve and green cuff were applied to the client's right upper extremity proximal to the axilla. His personal occlusion pressure was assessed and 50% of his arterial blood flow to his non-dominant upper extremity was occluded. 20% of the client's one rep max, was, which was equivalent to 45 pounds, was used to complete the exercise on the pectoral flight machine. He completed four sets with the first set consisting of 30 repetitions and then the subsequent three sets consisting of 15 repetitions each. The entire intervention for each session took at least 30 minutes to complete. After the workout, the client consumed one scoop of protein powder mixed with water. The intervention was continued on two non-consecutive days a week with the rest day in between for six weeks. The client received a total of 12 treatment sessions. The case presentation for this study was a physically active 23-year-old male who had a goal of improving his non-dominant pectoralis major muscle strength. 12 sessions of MFR, BFR, and protein powder were administered for two non-consecutive days a week for six weeks. After the six weeks concluded, post-study testing was performed to determine if an increase in strength had occurred. The outcome of the study was that the results showed an overall improvement in the client's strength in his right pectoralis major muscle. Compared to the initial measurements, the client's strength improved in his non-dominant upper extremity by 5.491 pounds, which is an 18.82 increase in strength. This strength gain corresponds with our hypothesis. Some discussion and action plan. Um, BFR and the consumption of protein powder resulted in the strength gains to the non-dominant pectoralis major muscle. The combination of these interventions were beneficial to the client and correlated with the hypothesis of this study. Hi, my name is Bailey Burke. I'm a student in the Masters of Athletic Training program. My research is on the reliability of visiomotor reaction time on the reflection edge light board. Before I begin, I'd like to give a special thanks to my co-authors on this study, Dr. Scott Bruce, Dr. Carlita Moore, and Dr. Robert Bradley. 
So what is visiomotor reaction time? Visiomotor reaction time is the amount of time it takes for a person to react to a visual stimulus. Visiomotor reaction time is also measured as the sum of latency time and motor time. The reflection edge is a light board that is about two feet by six feet um, and consists of 2,400 LED lights that will show up on the board in various patterns to challenge a, a person's visiomotor reaction time and hand-eye coordination. Little research to date has been done on this particular piece of equipment. So the purpose of this study was to determine the reliability of visiomotor reaction time on the reflect reflection edge light board amongst physically active graduate students. So we recruited participants from the College of Nursing and Health Professions. We, per we recruited a total of 20 participants where 18 completed the study. Each participant was brought in for four different sessions with about 24 to 36 hours in between each session. The first one acted as a practice to familiarize each participant with the equipment as well as the tests that would be run. Whereas sessions two through four were used for data collection and comparison. So each the three tests that each participant completed were big G, which was used as a warm up during each session, session followed by simple reaction time and complex reaction time. Data was analyzed using test retest reliability between sessions one, two, two to three, and then one to three. So what we found from this study is that simple reaction time as well as complex reaction time are reliable um, for visiomotor reaction time on the reflection edge with simple reaction time showing a high positive correlation, which is which means that each correlation fell between 0.7 and 0.9. These values can be viewed on table one on the poster. Whereas complex reaction time, we saw a bit more variation between total reaction time as well as the breakdown of right and left. With complex reaction time showing going from moderate positive to low positive reliability. And as you can see, big G, since it was used as a warm up and we are unable to differentiate between right and left performance, showed low to negligible correlation. So here's a breakdown of our findings. As you can see up at the top with big G, we aren't showing any statistical significance except between trials one to two and two to three. But again, because we could not differentiate between right and left performance, this was used as a warm up. Right down here with simple reaction time, as you can see, each amongst all trials, each correlation was shown to be statistically significant on the 0 0.01 level. And then right down here in table three with complex reaction time, you can see the variation between each session as well as the total reaction time and then the right and left reaction times. Here are my references. Thank you again um, to my co-authors on this study as well as each participant that took the time to participate in this study. Thank you. Hey, my name is Lorenzo Catapain and I'm a student in the physical therapy program. And I'm here today to present our research study, which is called the effects of blood flow restriction and myofascial release at the upper extremity, a case study report. So I'm gonna begin by talking about the introduction and purpose of our study. Strength gains have typically been achieved through high intensity exercises. Research shows blood flow restriction or BFR is a type of training where low intensity exercise is combined with blood flow occlusion to produce similar results to high intensity training. Flexibility is important for efficient movement. So myofascial release or MFR is a manual technique using gentle sustained pressure to stretch myofascial tissue and increase flexibility, which promotes efficient movement. The purpose of this case study was to determine if BFR with MFR would produce increased strength gains of the pectoralis major. Next, our objectives. This research was to see the effects of BFR and MFR 
on a healthy subject before we started the larger research study. We believe that a combination of BFR and MFR training will produce more strength gains at the proximal upper extremity musculature than BFR training in the line. Next, for our interventions. This study was conducted two times per week for six weeks. Every session included an MFR for three minutes on the participant's pectoralis major before obtaining his occlusion pressure. Once the occlusion pressure was obtained, the patient performed 75 repetitions at 20% of his one rep max, which was 40 pounds, on a pect pectoral fly machine. The 75 reps was broken down into four sets, one set of 30 reps followed by three sets of 15 reps, and had seven minutes to complete the 75 reps. A scheme of 75 reps and four sets is very common and frequently used in BFR. The participant was instructed while performing the reps to hold concentrically for one second and eccentrically for two seconds. After he completed the exercise, he was given one scoop of whey protein with water, which contained 60 grams of, pro of protein. The participant received a total of 12 treatment sessions. Now for the case presentation, the participant is a 24-year-old male who is a full-time doctor of physical therapy student um, at Arkansas State University. He lives an active lifestyle and tries to implement protein from his food intake. He is right-hand dominant and engages in exercise, mainly resistance training, 45, uh, 45 days per week for about two to three hours. The, the participant has no previous experience of BFR or MFR. Now for our outcome. Pre and post intervention measurements were taken using a dynamometer for pectoralis strength and using the pectoral machine for one repetition maximum, one RM, to, discern, to determine strength gains. The participant's one rep max chest fly increased by 55 pounds. However, there was no significant change in the pect pectoralis major muscle strength. Lastly, for our discussion, the case study observed the effects of low intensity exercise in combination with BFR, MFR, and the intake of protein powder to determine if the participant's upper extremity strength will increase. The dynamometer results for the non-dominant upper extremity did not show a significant change. However, this could be the result of the participant compensating during the initial me measurements, and therefore preventing an accurate show of improvement. The participant did increase the weight of the 1RM on the pectoral fly machine, the participants 1RM improved using a low load intensity exercise with BFR and MFR. However, caution should be taken with generalizability because this study had only one participant. More research is needed to investigate the relationship between BFR and MFR. So that concludes my presentation today. So I appreciate you guys taking your time out to listening to our presentation. Have a good day. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kafaya Atiyonda, and I'm here to present my study titled The Effect of Sport-Related Concussion on Physical Performance of Collegiate Football Players. My mentor is Dr. Scott Bruce, and the co-authors are Dr. Robert Bradley and Dr. Carlita Moore. Sport-Related concussion are common among football players, and its effect on physical performance has not been established. Underreporting of concussion is a significant problem in all sports and at all levels of competition with 55% of these athletes either with or suspected of having a concussion failing to report this information to an authority figure. All body reactive agility is assessed via the tracer, true four tests, which includes the lateral agility, the lateral flanker, the diagonal agility, and the diagonal flanker. Standardization of data allows comparison across groups and the Z scores and T scores are two ways to standardize scores. The T score has a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. The purpose of this study was to examine the physical performance of Division I collegiate football players with and without a history of concussion. Baseline testing on Tracer was done on all participants with the test including the lateral agility and the diagonal agility. This involves the athletes either moving to the left or right or to the back. The lateral flanker and the diagonal flanker incorporates the cognitive aspect into the test, which involves the athletes either resp responding to the center or the middle arrow. Statistical outputs included averages and asymmetries of each test and metric with 95% confidence interval provided. The participants of this study included two NCAA Division I intercollegiate football teams with a total of 182 players. PFT tests found no statistical difference between the two teams. 
where the independent t-test were run to determine the differences between those with and without a concussion history, with a p-value set at less than or equal to 0.05. Concussion history was obtained from the pre-participation physical exam and the impact test data. Analysis were performed in two ways, the skill position only and the linemen only. The skill position players included the quarterback, the running back, the wide receiver, the defensive back, the linebacker, and the kicker. While the linemen included the offensive line, the defensive line, the tight hands, and the defensive hands. The raw data were converted to the T-scores to aid in the standardization and interpretation of the data. The ROC analysis and the area under the curve of greater than or equal to 0 0.600 were selected. Predicted probabilities were calculated through logistic regression. From the results of this study, three variables provided the greatest discrepancy between those with and without a concussion history for the skilled players, with two of these variables indicating those that do not have a concussion history. The odd ratios range from 1.64 to 3.07. For the linemen players, five variables provided the greatest discrepancy between those with and without a concussion history. All five variables were measures of averages with the odd ratio ranging between 1.98 to 2.94 with a tight confidence interval. Predictor probability provide an estimate of the weights for the model's positive factors. The first table shows the results for the skill position players only with the first and last variable indicating those that do not have a concussion history. Table two shows the results for the linemen only with the five variables indicating those that do have a concussion history. This figure shows the ROC analysis with the area under the curve. For the skills players, the area under the curve was 0.717 and for the linemen was 0.642. This shows how the model best fits the participants. The clinical relevance of the study. From this study, it was discovered that there is a difference between the physical performance of those with and without a concussion history, which is inconsistent with other studies. T-scores allows clinicians to make comparison between these teams. This study provides metric-specific data to aid in the identification of Division I college football players who may underreport their concussion history. These are my references. Thank you for listening. And thank you to everyone who participated in this study. Hi, my name is Anna Lefebvre. I'm a second year grad student here at Arkansas State University in the athletic training program. The title of my research is Comparison of Tracer Performance Across Three Different Levels of NCAA Division I Football Classifications. Co-authors on my project include Dr. Scott Bruce, Dr. Carly Moore, and Dr. Robert Bradley. For my introduction, there are three levels of NCAA athletics, Division I, Division II, and Division III. My study focused on Division I, which is the highest level of competition. Division I is broke down into two subdivisions, FBS and FCS. The FBS includes the Power Five and Group of Five, and the FCS is also known as the 1AA division. For my study, we used the Tracer, which is a relatively new piece of technology that no normative data has been established for yet. Using this, we assessed four metrics, speed, reaction time, acceleration, and deceleration as well. Most of these tests focus on using only one metric, although with the Tracer, we were able to assess all four at one time. My purpose statement is to compare Tracer performance between the different D1 football levels and to establish normative data for each of these metrics. All of my data was obtained from the Tracer corporate office. This include data from 11 football programs and 374 total football players. They were assessed on four tests, lateral agility, diagonal agility, lateral flanker, and diagonal flanker. For the lateral agility, targets will pop up and it will tell the athlete if they need to move to the right or the left. Diagonal agility is very similar. Instead of side to side, they're going diagonally back to the left or back to the right. For the lateral flanker, five arrows will pop up. The athlete has to focus on the middle arrow. The middle arrow will tell them to go to the right or to the left. For the diagonal flanker, very similar. 
the athlete has to focus on the middle arrow when five of them pop up. And it will indicate if the athlete needs to move diagonally back to the right or diagonally back to the left. For my analysis, normative data included means, medians, standard deviations, the 25th, 75th, 90th, and 95th percentiles. It also included the 50th percentile, but that's also known as the mean. Missing values were replaced with the mean for that variable. Outliers that were greater than three standard deviations above the mean were replaced with the mean plus three standard deviations. Asymmetry is defined as the percentage difference between right and left side execution. For my results, they reflect normative data for each of the four tests and four metrics. The outcomes were presented as means, standard deviations, and percentiles for each metric per classification along with the percentile measurements. The asymmetries ranged from a high of 34.8% to a low of 5.9%. Unexpectedly, the FCS programs routinely outperformed group of five programs and even some power five programs on just a few metrics. This is showing my table of normative data. On my poster, all values were shown. Here, the gray areas indicate statistically significant variables. Their superscripts and footnotes indicate where those differences are. For my clinical relevance, normative data for D1 football was established. Clinicians could use this as a reference point when working with their athletes. And limitations on my study were that we did not break it down by position groups. These are my references. I would like to thank Dr. Bruce, Dr. Moore, and Dr. Bradley for helping me through the program and this research. I'd also like to thank my family and my uh, fellow classmates. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Laura Lynn and my research was comparative baseline game statistic data for intercollegiate men's and women's basketball. My mentors were Dr. Scott L. Bruce, Dr. Robert Bradley, and Dr. Carlita M. Moore. For this project, physical performance and functional movement were assessed in order to find a relationship between them and game statistical data. Functional movement was assessed using whole body reactive agility. Reaction time, speed, acceleration, and deceleration were used to test fitness factors. Game statistical data and tracer data were standardized using Z and T scores. This project's purpose was to determine if a correlation between intercollegiate men's and women's basketball game statistics and whole body reactive agility measures exist. <clears throat> In this study, 29 men's basketball players and 31 women's basketball players were baseline tested on the tracer prior to the start of the 2019-2020 and 2020-2021 season. The demographics for each team is listed below. The tracer used four tests that utilizes visual targets and arrows as directional cues. The agility test showed the participants visual targets while the flanker test had the participant respond to the middle arrow that only showed for one second. Game statistics from the 2019, 2020, and 2020, 2021 seasons were used. Tracer data and game statistics were compared using correlation analysis. 30 tracer factors were used, with 16 being averages and 16 being asymmetries. Asymmetry is the percentage difference between right and left performance. Between tracer factors and basketball statistical categories, there were 640 combinations found. In the end, Tracer did a better job of predicting the basketball performance for the women's basketball team compared to the men's basketball team. For the women's basketball team, 31 out of 640 combinations were found to be statistically significant, while the men's basketball team showed only 25 out of 640 to be statistically significant. In the beginning, we hypothesized that turnovers, steals, and blocks would be the best correlation. The women's basketball team showed that turnovers and steals were significantly significant, while the men's basketball team showed turnovers and blocks to be significant. Surprisingly, the tracer correlated to field goals made for the women's basketball team and field goal percentage for both teams. Overall, the women's basketball correlations ranged from 0.379 to 0.486, 
while the overall men's basketball correlations ranged from 0.403 to 0.529. Due to space limitations, tables one and two only show basketball statistical categories deemed statistically significant. The correlations found only reflect a single baseline performance on the tracer prior to the start of the preseason workouts. In the future, research could divide players into positions of guards and forwards for more specific outcomes. These are my references. I would like to thank my mentors, Dr. Scott L. Bruce, Dr. Robert Bradley, and Dr. Carlita M. Moore. I would also like to thank the Arkansas State men's and women's basketball teams for their participation in this study. Hello, my name is Lucas Williams. I'm a second year doctorate of physical therapy student and uh, my research partner, Ryan Smith, he's also second year doctorate of physical therapy student. And we looked at assessing upper extremity strength improvement by implementation of stretching and blood flow restriction exercise. And we received a lot of help from Dr. Latoya Green, Ms. Joanna Cup, and Mr. Eric West on this case study. So, an introduction to blood flow restriction. Basically, BFR is a type of training where you're going to include blood flow to an upper or a lower extremity, um, and you're going to perform resistance or aerobic exercise. Um, and then we also uh, use that with the doorway pec stretch, which is just a, a basic static um, pec stretch, um, just to improve range of motion, improve muscle length. And we look to use those together to see if we could use those together in order to increase one rep maximum, um, increase muscular strength, muscle, muscular force production. So that, that's basically what we were going for was just to see if those two things together can improve our, our strength. So in this uh, study, we started out with baseline measurements. We used dynamometer pec. Um, pec strength test and then we also did a one rep maximum on the pec fly machine and so a normal session would start out I would do three sets of 30 of the door weight pec stretch and then you would go into the blood flow restriction training which is a seven minute session where you begin doing 30 reps and then you're going to follow that up with three sets of 15 reps and then after the session was over we're going to do a scoop of protein, just some protein supplementation, just to help aid with muscle recovery and increase that strength. And we're going to do that two times a week for eight weeks, total of 16 sessions. And for this case, I was the participant personally, and um, we did see increases in muscular strength for, and force production. So the Beginning dynamometer measurements for the left arm were 24 pounds and it increased to 30 pounds. And then also in the right arm, we saw an increase from 29 to 31 pounds. And then a one rep max pec fly machine increased from 245 to 265. And um, yeah, so we did see significant increases in muscular strength and force production with this uh, case study. And a big implication for that is simply just the fact that using blood flow restriction training can increase your muscular force production and muscular strength, and it can be used for uh, exactly that. And um, this could be a very helpful thing to use with a patient or a client who um, maybe can't or doesn't want to work in that near maximal range or weight range, and they would rather work a more of a high repetition, lower weight, lower resistance training, this could be a good way to use that in order to still find those muscular strength increases without maybe taxing the joints or um, maybe just not getting too much into the heavier weight, heavier resistance, maybe could be looked at as a safer um, route to take. Um, but we did find that using blood flow restriction training can increase muscular strength and force production. Um, thank you for joining me. <laughs>